Good morning. It is Tuesday, May 16th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. We have two presentations before us uh, this morning before we get to general business. And the first is a proclamation recognizing American Craft Beer Week. And that will be presented by Council Members Ludke and Fanny Gonzalez. Good morning. Um, so I wanna thank everybody who's come today and I want to ask you to come on down for, for this portion of the program. So you get to, uh, and I'm gonna announce everybody who's here. If I miss your name, just t tap me and I'll, I'll make sure I say it. But um, from Astro Lab Brewing, we have Emma Whelan, Brookville Beer Farm, Kenny Borkman and Phil Muth, Landmade Brewery, Gabriel Scott, Lone Oak, Chris and Ralph Miller, True Respite, Brendan O'Leary and Wardaka, Jessica and Brett Snyder. Thank you for joining us today. Whoop. Don't knock over the microphone. That was good. <laughs> so thank you, Council President Glass for, um, and everyone here for celebrating American Craft Beer Week. Um, and do we have any folks here today from ABS? Anybody? No. Okay, because I was going to ask them to come on down too. Um, I am really fortunate to represent District 7 here on the council, which as, as the folks here have heard me say, when people want to know where my district is in Montgomery County, I say the land of the beer farms because that is in fact where my district is. Um, and aside from the beer, uh, these locations, whether they're up county or whether they're in downtown Silver Spring, are a vital part of our community. They bring community together um, and they collaborate with other small businesses, which has been really wonderful for me to see over time as, um, as we all work to enhance our economic development in the county. So a few weeks ago, actually no, Chris told me it was over a month ago, the time's flying, I got to visit um, Lone Oak after the fall of the lone oak tree um, following a storm. And I urge everyone to take a look at the video that we made out there that talks about the history of that property and sort of the new legacy of what will come from the, uh, the buds of that oak, which now, as he showed me this morning, um, they grafted many, many pieces trying to hope that they would be able to salvage part of the, the lone oak to replant on the property and two of them took and they have leaves. So I'm optimistic that the lone oak's legacy will carry on. Um, I want to thank, and Julie's not here, right, Julie Verratti? But I do want to thank Julie Verratti um, from Denizens and Emily Bruno from Denizens for being the first production brewery in our county. Um, it took a lot of work for them to get up and running. It took a lot of work for them to get local and state laws changed in order to facilitate this business and look at the industry that's grown from that. Um, and it will continue to benefit entrepreneurs for years to come. So thank you to all of you for the work that you do. Um, and I know, please know that we are all partners to you in your work and we're here to, to help and assist you. And now, turn it over to Council Member Fanny Gonzalez. Thank you, good morning everyone. So local craft beer breweries are a lot of fun and contribute so much to the quality of life of all residents. Uh, from Silver Spring, Kensington, Rockville, and Gatesburg, all the way to Poolsville, Laytonsville, and Brookville, these breweries provide the community amazing space to gather, not just for adults, but with our little ones. And I've been to pretty much every single one of, of your breweries with my children and my husband. Our local breweries are also, also provide a lot of investment in jobs into our community. My predecessors on the council and in the state delegation did a lot of the early hard work to create a better, more hospitable, hospitable regulatory environment. The results are overwhelmingly clear. We have a thriving craft beer ecosystem here in the county, but we are not done. And you can be assured that from my position as chair of the Economic Development Committee, that 
that we will hold DPS accountable, and I have been doing lots of tours with DPS, including in some of the breweries. They're not here, the one that I'm thinking of. <laughs> um, but we're gonna make sure that they are seen as allies uh, with a yes culture instead of being um, an agency that creates more challenges when you wanna do something great for our community. Uh, but the real heroes of this story are the entrepreneurs that you see here. They had a vision and determination. In some cases, they risk everything to follow that dream. These folks and their incredible businesses are just one of the reasons I am so proud to call Montgomery County home. I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge Astrolab as Emma and Matt will be moving on to new adventures and the best of luck in your future endeavors. And I hear in Potomac, you're gonna have a bottle um, you're going to talk about it, right? Hopefully. But you're going to stay in Montgomery County. <laughs> and it's not like they are leaving. I mean, there's another brewery that is coming in. So that's a very po important point to make. And with that, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, uh, Councilman Merluki, to introduce the next speakers. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I left one name off my list. So uh, I also want to welcome Christian Lake from Silver Branch Brewing, who's standing right behind me. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Jessica Snyder from Waradaka to say some words. Good morning. Thank you so much for honoring the Montgomery County Breweries today. We all very much support the, appreciate the long-standing support of the County Council from all of the breweries, including some that aren't here today. Astrolab, Baby Cat, Brookville Beer Farm, Denizens, Elder Pine, Land Made, Lone Oak, Seven Locks, Silver Branch, Saints Row, True Respite, and Wardaka, with more that are coming. As a group, Montgomery County Breweries continue to grow and positively impact our communities and local economy. Montgomery County Breweries matter. We provide jobs and taxable revenue. We are considered an asset to the tourism industry and our tap rooms and products sold locally help to keep residents spending dollars in our county. Montgomery County Breweries care. At our heart, we are gathering places for community engagement, events, and celebrations with family and friends. We are passionate about the environment and Maryland agriculture. We give back and support countless charities and nonprofit organizations. Each Montgomery County Brewery is independently owned and operated as small businesses. And small businesses continue to be the heartbeat of the Montgomery County economy. Thank you so much for recognizing our impact, our hard work, and our contributions to the Montgomery County. Cheers to the council. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I'll bring up council member Fanny Gonzalez so we can read the proclamation. The County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland Proclamation, whereas American Craft Beer Week was established in 2006 to recognize and celebrate small and independent breweries who have greatly impacted the beer world, and whereas as of 2021, the Maryland Craft Beer Breweries have produced 288,130 barrels of beer annually, contributing approximately $917 million to the local economy. And whereas Montgomery County's 15 craft breweries have demonstrated how these local businesses can help fuel our economy, boost our food system through encouraging agritourism, and support other small businesses through food truck nights, concerts, and other events. And whereas many craft breweries provide outdoor gathering spaces, delivered products directly to consumers, and embarked on other creative ways to provide a safe outlet for residents to gather during the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas adults in Montgomery County can responsibly enjoy and appreciate locally made beer with fellow craft beer lovers during American Craft Beer Week from May 15th to 21st, further enhancing their ties to the community and our agricultural roots. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes American Craft Beer Week and honors those in the craft beer industry for their role in our economy. We commit to serving our county's craft brewers in the same spirit of service through which they tirelessly grow, care for, and provide their local beer to Montgomery County residents, presented on this 16th day of May in the year 2023.
Well, cheers to that. Thank you very much for joining us at the council this morning. And um, thank you for all the joy and entertainment each of you bring to our community. Um, uh, the next proclamation is to designate May 2023 as Discover MoCo Month, and that will be led by Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we're here to celebrate Discover MoCo Month. We live in a great community. We have so many wonderful assets, and I'm sure all my colleagues will agree that one of the great things about this job is that we get to go and visit all these wonderful places, sometimes all in one weekend, uh, but we're, we're always out and about. Um, I'd like to introduce to ask our guests to come up, um, Kelly Groff of uh, Visit MoCo and her staff. Um, Katie Hecklinger from Black Rock Center for the Arts, Matt Libber from um, the Soccerplex, and we have a couple people from um, our economic development team, MCEDC, come up. And our breweries, please come on back up. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna, it's gonna be a big crowd. Um, hey, scoot, you can scooch up and scooch up. double rows and um, so. It's, all, it's great to have our breweries here, and I would like to tell you that uh, Councilmember Don Lukey and I were genius enough to have these proclamations on the same day, but <laughs> it was just sheer coincidence, and it was a lovely coincidence to have our breweries here uh, for Celebrate MoCo Week. Uh, um, Visit Montgomery is a leader in highlighting the many attractions, uh, I was gonna say bre breweries, eateries, historical sites and natural resources uh, located across Montgomery County, which is truly the state's cultural capital. Montgomery County is home to so many amazing tourist destinations in the state, and Visit Montgomery plays a huge part in promoting Montgomery County as a destination worth visiting. Visit Montgomery's Discover, Mo Discover MoCo Month is a great way for visitors and residents to learn about and celebrate the rich Montgomery County community by enjoying all the assets we have, immersing ourselves in the history through visiting our museums, spending time in the beautiful outdoor spaces, including the Ag Reserve, and shopping small at, at our so many local, thousands of local businesses. Um, so to talk a little bit about Visit Montgomery, I'm gonna ask uh, Kelly Groff to come up, uh, the Executive Director of Visit, Moca, the Visit Montgomery. Good morning. Thank you, Council Member Balcom. Thank you, Council President Glass and all members of the County Council. Marilyn said everything well, so all my notes are gone. <laughs> so I'm gonna wing this. Let me first introduce um, who's with me today. Staff members, uh, Lee Calicut, Yodit Kirabel, Corey Van Horn, Leticia Engel, friends from MCEDC, and Trek Buchter from our staff. Um, and it's really exciting to also have the breweries here behind us today. So um, tourism is economic development and our mission as an organization, which is celebrating its 40th year, um, is to make sure our residents, whether they're in the county or regional um, partners and visitors, uh, millions of which we welcome every year, come to our community and have a wonderful time while they're here. Two of the largest generators of hotel room nights that bring business to Montgomery County are standing behind me. Uh, David Child, who manages the county's asset, the Bethesda North Marriott Hotel and Conference Center, and Matt Libber from the Maryland Soccerplex, who welcomes over 700,000 visitors a year just at his, um, his facility. I'm sorry, one million. So <laughs> these are great partners as well as the wineries and breweries. Um, we proudly represent you. We um, are always pitching stories to travel writers, to magazines, as well as event and meeting planners that are considering our community. So please uh, discover MoCo this month. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And I just want a uh, big plug for her staff. I've worked with uh, the Visit Montgomery for many, many years, and they do such a fabulous job, so thank you so much. I now want to introduce um, Katie Hecklinger, the Executive Director of Black Rock Center for the Arts. 
Good morning, and thank you to the council, uh, especially Marilyn Balcom, who continues to be an up county and arts warrior um, in our sector. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Um, arts and culture are essential to our quality of life. They are not an add-on or an extra. A thriving arts and culture scene delivers on jobs, tourism, visibility, and relevance. When people connect with a place, there is a desire to visit, to return, to invest, and to make it home. Black Rock's founders 20 years ago uh, were celebrating this weekend with a lone oak beer. <laughs> Marilyn being one of those founders understood this, and as she puts it, the community insisted on Black Rock serving Germantown as its city center, now one of our nation's most diverse communities in the country. To truly discover MoCo is to better understand the importance of investing in the beauty of everyday life and how we experience it through a language we all have in common, the arts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I want to bring up Matt Liber from the Maryland Soccerplex. Matt. Council Member Balcom, members of the County Council, thanks for recognizing tourism as an important factor in Montgomery County. Uh, as Kelly pointed out, the Soccerplex alone brings in about a million visitors a year. Uh, just today, we're finishing up a five-day event that brought 5,000 athletes and 20,000 spectators to the county. And when those, county, when those people are in the county, they're spending money in our county at our breweries, um, at our art centers. They're staying in hotels with David. Um, and they're spending money in our businesses. Uh, the Soccerplex brings in about $37 million a year in economic activity to this county. Sports tourism as a whole is a $44.5 billion industry. To give you a comparison, the NFL is $16 billion. So these are the activities that we want to bring to the county and keep doing it to make us a thriving community. That deserves an applause, guys. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. So if you uh, please um, check out uh, Visit MoCo. Uh, if you haven't checked out their website, it's fabulous. Um, and they also have an app, so please make sure that that's a that's a regular that you're checking that regularly and visiting all the wonderful wonderful places. Um, and so I'm excited to present this proclamation uh, today for designated des designated May as Discover MoCo Month. All right, these tend to be long. Sorry. <laughs> Whereas Montgomery County is the most visited destination in Maryland with hospitality, tourism, recreational, sports, cultural, and entertainment sectors that contribute significantly to the state economy. And whereas Visit Montgomery has planned a month-long celebration of Montgomery County's entrepreneurial spirit that will be a significant driver of tourism and boost the county's economy through May. And whereas National Small Business Week, April 30th through May 6th, was deemed Shop MoCo Week and highlighted small businesses unique to our county. And whereas National Travel and Tourism Week, May 7th through the 13th, was deemed MoCo Hotel Week and encouraged visitation at Montgomery County throughout lodging stays at the county's hotel pro um, properties. And whereas May 14th through 20th this week, Montgomery, uh, visit Montgomery's Third annual MoCo Eats Week will celebrate the culinary diversity in local restaurants that is reflective of Montgomery County's diverse population. And whereas May 21st through 31st, MoCo's kickoff to Summer Week will spotlight <clears throat> unique attractions, experiences, world-class performance venues, renowned museums, and encourage tourism in Montgomery all summer long. Whereas Montgomery County's craft beverage producers will feature all month throughout Visit Montgomery's tra uh, Taste Makers Trail. Now, therefore, be it resolved that M the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby designates May 2023 as Discover MoCo Month, um, signed by uh, Council President Eva Glantz and um, myself. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much for those presentations and celebrations this morning. Uh, I will now turn it over to Madam Clerk. Do you have any agenda changes or announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We just have one agenda a cha change to announce today. On our consent calendar, we've added item number I, action, supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY23 operating budget, Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS COVID-19 emergency response, $5 million. The source of funds is general fund undesignated revenues. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll hear from you again later this morning. Um, so the clerk has circulated the minutes for March 21st, April 13th, April 18th, and April 25th, and minutes from a closed session meeting from April, 20, uh, April 11th. Are there any changes? Not hearing any changes, those are approved. Uh, we're now gonna move into legislative day 16 and call of bills for final reading. Uh, the first bill is Bill 1423, Late Night Business Safety Plan. The Public Safety Committee recommends enactment with amendments. Uh, I will turn it over to the Chair of the Public Safety Committee, Chair Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I want to thank you, in, not only as being Mr. President here, but in your role in working with us on this late night legislation. I also want to publicly thank Councilmember Stewart, Councilmember Jawando, and all of our staffs, so I was included in that, as well as the county executive, and especially Dr. Earl Stoddard, who I see, some, there he is, he snuck in the room a couple seconds ago, uh, Chief Jones and Captain Reed uh, from the police department, and all other departments as well. And of course, we want to very publicly thank Ms. Wellen, uh, Weldon, uh, Wellens, who, who uh, who uh, worked with us literally tirelessly to, uh, to get us here today. This legislation was done to help businesses be successful at the same time, keeping our residents and our businesses safe. After much discussion at our public safety committee, we did have a three to zero vote with some amendments. And Ms. President, if it meets with your approval, I'm gonna turn it back to you if you would ask others to speak uh, whose names I have mentioned and others beyond, and then turn it back to Ms. Wellens to uh, lead us through the legislation and amendments. Uh, I think that sounds like a great plan. Uh, I believe that Councilmember Stewart would like to make some opening comments as well before we turn it over to, to Ms. Wellens to walk us through. Great, oh, well, thank you very much. I wanna add um, my thanks to those that uh, Chair Katz mentioned, and particularly to extend my thanks to the uh, Public Safety Committee for doing all the work that you did um, on the uh, bill that was sent over to us from the County Exec's Office. Very much appreciate that. Um, as uh, Chair Katz said, you know, this is so important to help our businesses succeed as well as um, provide for our whole community. Uh, we want to make sure that throughout our county, uh, people are able to live, work, and play. And play sometimes means later in the evening uh, for some folks. And I was actually able to, on this Friday night, uh, last Friday night, be in downtown Silver Spring um, from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, so that I could experience some of the late night that we have uh, in our county. And I was glad to uh, see some of the businesses, some of the work that they've been already doing with our local police department and uh, other county offices to really make sure that they're operating safely and our entire community uh, can enjoy. And so I'm looking forward to the conversation on this and moving forward with it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wellens, you wanna walk us through the committee recommendations? Um, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Council President and Vice President and Council Members and good morning. Um, so, the Public Safety Committee, as was mentioned, uh, thoroughly reviewed the bill and made some recommended amendments. The committee also uh, thoroughly discussed a particular issue about the definition of late night business that would be subject to the bill. And I'll get to that in a moment, but it is an issue for which the Public Safety Committee has asked for the assistance of the full council. 
Uh, let me briefly uh, summarize the amendments that were uh, adopted 3-0 by the committee. Um, there are, well, preliminarily this, you know, this bill requires late night safety plans for certain types of businesses um, in coordination with the county government. Um, the Public Safety Committee uh, adopted amendments to define businesses that are subject to the bill to include those with licenses for on-site cannabis consumption, in addition to, uh, as the original bill stated, to, uh, licenses for tobacco, um, alcohol, or food, you know, looking towards the future, um, cannabis was included. Um, the committee decided that the bill should apply countywide as opposed to being limited to certain priority areas identified uh, by the county police department. So um, the bill would have countywide application. The committee voted to include, uh, explicitly include multiple departments in the development of regulations and implementation of the safety plans under the bill and also required various departments to pr provide training to the late night businesses. Uh, voted to eliminate the requirement that a business with, a, with a, um, a safety plan requiring video surveillance must share that surveillance uh, with the police department. When there's not a warrant present, of course, it would still be required when a warrant is present. Um, an amendment to permit late night businesses to appeal any plan disapprovals to the Board of Appeals so that there will be an administrative appeal process instead of going straight to the courts. Of course, the Board of Appeals decision could then be uh, appealed to the courts um, if desired. An amendment to uh, create a grant program to support the implementation of late night business safety programs. Um, an amendment to expedite the bill and also an amendment to adopt a transition clause um, to allow for uh, late night businesses that are subject to the bill to have an on-ramp and have time to develop the plans before uh, they're subject to the law's requirements. The issue that the committee has asked for the full, full council to weigh in on, um, again, relates to the definition of late night businesses and specifically, uh, their hours of operation. As originally introduced, the bill would apply to certain businesses that operate any time between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, the committee decided that 6 a.m. Um, would be over-inclusive and include, you know, for example, or, um, early opening diners and decided that that time should be moved to 5 a.m. instead. Um, so that was a definitive position of the committee, but they also um, discussed two options regarding the definitions. The first option uh, supported by Council Member Juwanda was to um, have a, 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 just a, a clear line of any business operating um, any time between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m that has one of the licenses I previously mentioned and has the on-site consumption would be required, would be deemed a late night business and required to do the plan. The second option, um, which, which was supported by council members uh, Stewart, um, Chair Katz, and uh, the council president, sorry, <laughs> I, was like, I knew there was someone else there. Um, was uh, to have kind of a two-fold definition, one, that any business uh, with one of the licenses with on-site consumption that operates between the hours of 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. would be deemed a late-night business, would have to do a safety plan. But in addition to that, if there is a business that operates between midnight and 2 a.m. and has been the subject of two or more service calls for law enforcement to re respond to serious incidents during the prior 12 months, then those uh, businesses also would come under the umbrella and have to provide a late, a late night plan. Um, the serious incidents would include certain serious crimes that would be identified by the police department through method to regulations. With your permission, Mr. President, I wanted to invite Dr. Stoddard, who could help yes, the council, uh, <laughs> you know, discern which which path it wants to take as well. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, do you have any opening comments, Dr. Starter, or do you want to engage if we 
I just, I just wanted to say I, I very much appreciate the work of both the Public Safety Committee and the Council members who participated in this process. This is frankly how the legislative process should work. A proposal is made, amendments, uh, public hearing is had, uh, amendments are made based on that public input, and we get to the point we are today where we have some uh, decisions and hopefully a, hopefully a final product. So thank you very much to the Council. Uh, thank you, uh, and I agree with you that this is uh, the de deliberative legislative process, uh, and Ms. Wellens, thank you for that detailed uh, report out. Uh, so, uh, colleagues, we have uh, an option before us that the Public Safety Committee has, has requested our input on uh, before we take final action. Um, uh, option one, as noted, uh, require, defines late-night business uh, for any business operating between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. Um, to shorthand it, and then option two defines late night business uh, as operating between 2 and 5 a.m. Um, or if a business operating between 12 and 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. Um, is the subject of two or more service calls. Is that correct, Ms. Wellens? Okay. Um, and so uh, let me just start by saying we want all of our residents and patrons to be safe and to feel safe when they're out in our community. And over the last number of years, years um, there have been some very unsettling incidents um, late at night. And that is the reason this legislation has been put forward. There were a lot of alternatives, lots of discussion about how to make our patrons and residents feel safe um, and how to get our business owners to be even better business owners late in the middle of the night to make everybody feel safe. And uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Stoddart and the county executive putting forward this proposal. I'll say I don't think this is a perfect proposal, but it gets us closer to helping create some parameters around businesses and around a time of day where there aren't a whole lot of parameters. A lot of the incidents that have occurred over the last number of years that have been unsettling to so many people, so many of my immediate neighbors, um, happened during the witching hours between 2 and 5 a.m. And when people wake up and see on the news things that have happened, they contacted us, they contacted me, and here we are. Um, you know, just. Three weeks ago, I went on a ride along with the members of the third district and the east side of the county. And between 12 and 2, 3 o'clock, we drove around the greater downtown Silver Spring area from White Oak South, just seeing what was going on on a regular weeknight. And there was activity, there were people out. Um, it was a relatively quiet night, but I saw firsthand some of the concerns that residents have. And we have to do something to make the situation better. And I think that this is one way to tackle that and to address those concerns. Now, for the options that are uh, before us, uh, let me say two things. One, uh, I disagree with the committee proposal to make this countywide. I don't think late night businesses in all parts of the county face the same situation, um, but I respect the committee's recommendation um, as much as I might disagree with it. I think we should use uh, our resources where they are needed. Uh, but with respect to the question before us, businesses that serve alcohol are legally allowed to be open till two. There is nothing out of order for them to operate until two. And what the, object the objective of this legislation has been to put some parameters around businesses that are operating outside of the normal scope of rules, regulations, and laws. And that happens to be between two and five a.m. And for that reason, I will support option number two so that we use our resources where they're most needed. And if there are businesses that are violating rules, regulations, or laws between 12 and 2, they need to be put on notice. And according to option 2, they would be subject to this law. 
but I do not think that we should apply this to businesses that are operating legally between the hours of 12 and 2, using their alcohol permit within the scope of jurisdiction. This is to help put parameters around those that are not operating within the rules. And so for that reason, I will support option number two. Uh, Council Member Sales. Um, just want to thank, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Want to thank my colleagues for um, introducing this legislation to respond to um, some of the concerns that our residents have faced and the uptick in violence that has happened between these hours. Um, before I move to support um, either option, I did have some questions about um, some of the amendments that have been made. Um, just wanted to um, better understand um, if we've explored the anticipated costs uh, this will impose on our businesses. Yeah, so many of the measures will not have a cost associated their plan their planning. They may be staff time uh, recommendations. Now, obviously, when we talk about individualized businesses, it will depend in part what their current situation is. So, for example, uh, the, the bill contemplates things like lighting. And so depending on the lighting conditions around the establishment, it, what they have in place will affect how much they might need to invest to become a well-lit establishment. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna, as we develop the regulations, we'll have a better sense of that. But I think, you know, part of what the, part of the amendments that the Public Safety Committee made was to add a grant program to help subsidize some of the costs for the business owners because we largely agree that this this is a community we need the we need the participation sure. of the businesses but ne yes. not necessarily uh, we're not interested in doing harm to the businesses in such a way that they won't they, they can't make ends meet to operate okay um, I also noticed that there was a discussion about the bill's implementation and who would lead this effort what does the implementation involve besides requesting a plan how are you I guess um, evaluating that plan or what does what's what does this involve yes yeah, so the regulations that we develop afterwards that the council will see and I frankly oh, okay. we, we want the council to be participants in okay. development of those regulations will will uh, uh, both provide direction on certain things that a plan must require but also provide other additional recommendations and that and, and the regulations would then be taken by a business and used to develop a plan and that plan would be reviewed by the entities identified in the bill that the, the council has broadened to make sure that it's consistent with the intent of both the law and the regulations. Okay. Does it specify in the bill who will lead the implementation? I know that that was recommended. And is there a reason why there was such specificity on its implementation? There was a robust discuss discussion during the Public Safety Committee regarding implementation of the bill. Um, and the decision made by the committee was, if this was a two to one decision, was to retain uh, as originally drafted the police department as the lead agency that would be um, responsible for issuing the regulations, responsible for approving or disapproving late night business plans. There was a discussion of a potential amendment uh, that Council Member Mink had put forward during the Public Safety Committee to involve regional service directors as the individuals or officials who would be approving or disapproving the plans. Um, and the Public Safety Committee uh, did not choose to go, go that path, um, but did include regional service centers along with other relevant agencies, including uh, DPS, um, uh, the Health Department, um, it, it, they define them as relevant agencies that would uh, contribute to um, consulting about what should be in the regulations, uh, to providing needed training for late night businesses, um, and as Dr. Stoddard said, to you know help in the review of plans and the contribution to you know what should be in the plans. And Christy, could you also make mention of the other amendment in, in that regard? Oh, <clears throat> Okay, um, okay. so we'll get more information about that process once this bill is voted on. 
of who's implementing or is it already no it, it would be as as recommended by the public safety committee it would be the police department would be the primary agency responsible um, and i should also mention there was additionally discussion of a proposal by um, council members stewart and Jawando to um, place the county executive off the office of the county executive itself at the helm of implementation instead of the police department but it also allowed for the office of the county executive to designate a department or office within the county government that would be the lead so okay. that would still uh leave open the possibility it could be the police department it could be the county executive it could be a different entity okay okay that's helpful to know um I'm also um, concerned about expediting this bill. Um, we have to give businesses time to develop these plans and also for um, us to create the implementation process and organize the entities who are going to be responding, whether it's giving out warnings, um, what that process will even look like. And so um, can we, make sure that this is um, implemented um, under the normal time frame to give everyone the correct time so the public safety committee did um, recommend expediting the bill um, in recognition of its urgency and also to get it on the books as soon as possible however at the same time they did anticipate what what the council member saying about um, a transition period um, there is if you um, I'm at circle eight of the packet, and if you, this is the committee's version of the bill, and if you, starting at line 163 of the bill, there's an implementation section that would require um, the implementing department to provide the regulations to the council within 180 days um, after the act becomes law, and then it wouldn't be until 90 days after the regulations take take effect um, until um, any business would be required to submit a plan. So that okay. would provide an on-ramp for them um, so that it wouldn't be as if on day one you're expected to have a plan approved that you know, and you're not aware of the parameters. So how are we going to be sharing this new law with them? Are we providing a template for what this plan should look like? What guidance are we providing to the businesses? Yes, great, great point. And the part of the bill re does require, um, part of the bill as amended would require a template plan and um, the lead agency, um, you know, currently the police department in conjunction with the other relevant agencies would be responsible for putting together that template to help guide um, the business in the creation of the plan. All right, thank you so much. Um, I will also uh, join my colleague in supporting um, option number two, and I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for for being here. Good to see you, Lieutenant. I was going to call you Lieutenant. Yeah. You're, excuse me. You're a captain now. <laughs> um, so this bill uh, is important for a lot of reasons. It, it addresses some concerns that our community has uh, around public safety and so it's important that we're talking about it uh, the couple things i want to raise uh, i want to thank the committee i want to thank councilmember katz and stewart and other and councilmember mink and lukey who are on the committee for their diligent work um, I, it's funny i i called you lieutenant but you were lieutenant when a couple years ago we convened the businesses in downtown silver spring with the police department for at that time, which was the first time with many of the business owners there, a lot of them, and uh, that has yielded good fruit. Uh, and I was happy to be able to do, do that and lead that with our office and that has continued and it's changed the environment. I know you've talked about this before as has Chief Jones and Commander McBain. Um, and there's partnership with the businesses now. There's a, there's a big WhatsApp group, WhatsApp group with the downtown Silver Spring businesses that uh, I still look at sometimes where they're communicating and, and working together. Um, and so that's been progress, but we, more progress needs to be made. Um, I appreciate the committee for making this a countywide bill and creating an appeals process, um, requiring public safety training. 
and those are all positive amendments. There's a few others I want to talk about, including the one that we're considering now. Uh, the bill should be 12 to 5. Uh, as it was originally introduced, it was 12 to 6. Um, I propose 12 to 5 and agree with the, you know, we don't want to catch the uh, diner crowd. That's not the intent here. Um, but I think 12 to 5 makes sense for a number of reasons. One, and probably chief among them, is equity. Uh, it can only be a countywide bill uh, if it's 12 to 5 a.m. It just, it's just a fact. Um, and police department and I don't always agree, but I think we agree on this point. Uh, uh, and I'll just let you state that on the record. Captain Reed, I think Chief Jones and you agree that it should be 12 to 5. I do believe it should be 12 to 5. And I think, um, and, and, and I concur, and I, I tip my hat to the council for making this a countywide bill because I think we have proved, and again, I will give you credit for setting that initial meeting because I saw such a benefit and to use that as a stepping stone to bridge the gap between the businesses and the police department because we you know we've always talked about staffing and numbers. Uh, it takes a partnership in order for us to work together to bring real change and safety to our community. Um, so I think we have shown working with places like society and counties that you know, and Dr. Stardard was there from the initial onset of these business compliance checks. They listened to the handheld metal detectors. They listened to um, dressing their staff professionally and um, how to do secondary pat downs and how to de-escalate situations, how to work with law enforcement, how to do adequate lighting. And we haven't had calls for service in their establishments in 10 months. And we talk about nighttime legislation. We talk about, you know, keeping the community safe in the nighttime, well, let's do it in the nighttime, not just in particular hours um, between two and five. I, I believe it. I believe it is equitable, and I believe it puts every business on a playing field. We want to work with you. This is not about shutting you down. This is not about us telling you how to run your business. This is us working in a partnership with you in order to make the community safe, in order to bring in your patrons where you're going to make that profit. So I believe this is a good plan. I appreciate that. Um, and agree with you, agree with everything you said. You mentioned a uh, society whose owner was at the press conference when the county executive announced this bill, who ironically enough would not be covered by the bill if this amendment, the second amendment would be going forward unless there were the two serious incidents. And I know I have issues with that as well, which we'll, we'll get to about how that's defined and how that would work. I think it's very un, unworkable. If you look, and I've done this, I've driven around the county from two to five in all of our downtown areas that have nightlife the only businesses that will be covered by that are immigrant and black and brown owned businesses primarily. Um, and uh, many that don't have a liquor license because you can't, but that they live, they're either food or hookah or other types of establishments that have cultural meaning and significance to the black and indigenous populations. Um, and this bill would be specifically targeting them maybe not intentionally but would be but in practice that would is what it would be doing and it would be saying the violence problem is something that is your problem and it's not we know that there's crime up in all times of the day uh, and we have a response to that but this is to focus on late night to captain reed's point if we're going to focus on late night let's focus on late night things happen at 12 30 they happen at 1 a.m uh, one of the main proponent, business proponents of this bill who has done great work at society, they should have a plan and they will have a plan and, and we should, it should be part of it. It could be used to coordinate with others. Uh, and we shouldn't be targeting specific businesses uh, this, as this does. The racial equity statement, uh, while indeterminate, does point out that uh, it could have a negative impact, particularly if it targets specific communities or types of businesses, uh, which is what this second amendment would do. Um, I, I, so I strongly believe uh, that this needs to be 12 to 5 as the for reasons I've stated and the reasons that the police department have stated. Uh, there's, prop, there's only about 20 to 30 businesses in the county that would co be covered and they are not responsible for the late night crime and violence in a, in a proportionate way. Um, so uh, I just think that this is good practice and if we're going to have people do it, if we want it to be countywide, which was the committee's determination, it should be 12 to 5. Um, I have comments on other parts of the bill, but I'll pause uh, since that since this is what we're on. So I would again strongly urge colleagues that we look at the 12 to 5 uh, time frame. Serious provisions. That's serious incidents. 
that's an administrative nightmare. I don't know who's deciding that, how's it defined. Uh, it, it's not a. It's not something that we should we should be looking into. Thank you, Councilmember Stewart. Thank you, and thank you, Councilmember Jawando, for your work on this, and uh, Captain Reed uh, as well. And, and thank you, Dr. Stoddard, for being here. Um, I very much appreciate uh, the comments of my colleague, um, Councilmember Jawando, in pointing out um, the uh, his reasons for supporting option one. Um, I'm going to support option two um, after speaking with um, a number of businesses um, and also thinking about how we are going to implement this and do this well. Um, if we were to extend this to all businesses 12 to 5, um, you know, my concern in the short term would be the number of businesses and making sure that we're doing this well. I think focusing on the 20 or 30 businesses that are open from two to five, making sure that we're getting this right, that it is a true partnership between our county government and our local businesses um, is very important. In addition, um, the provision option two does talk about how uh, businesses open from 12 to 2 can voluntarily opt into this. Um, so I think that is important um, as well because we we want this to be a partnership and not something that um, people are feeling is overly burdensome because we want, as we have seen, as Captain Reed, as you've talked about, um, it has it has been good for the community. It has been good for these businesses that have already started to work with you to put in place many of these things. Um, and so. For those reasons and the fact that the, uh, you know, working with the Greater Silver Spring Chamber, the Restaurant Association, all of them who have had um, concerns about how this would be implemented and working with um, some of the local businesses, I'm going to support option two. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Oh, let's good to be back. Hello, everybody. Um, and I did test negative for the third time today. So, uh, but wearing a mask just just to be safe. And thank you, colleagues. And uh, I don't think the statute of limitations has expired on Happy Mother's Day. So, uh, it's the first time we've been together. So, a uh, cu couple of things. Um, when I was in high school, my mom told me nothing good happens after midnight. Uh, I totally disagreed with her. Uh, and then I now I have two teenagers, uh, and I know exactly what she was talking about. But be that as it may, this is actually the 13 year anniversary of the Nighttime Economy Task Force that Council Members Jawando, Glass, and I participated in uh, over a decade ago because it's important for a community to have different arts and entertainment and just entertainment options. And often uh, those late night options are beneficial to an entire society and a community to allow people to let loose in a way that's productive and healthy and helpful and that also contributes to our overall economy. Those are all really great things. But I think the rash of incidences that we saw starting two summers ago uh, really shook all of us. And it happened to correspond to the same time that all of my colleagues on this dais and I were knocking on doors and there was no ambiguity when you were walking on, knocking on doors in and around downtown Silver Spring and other urban district areas around the county. Um, the, there was deep concern raised and there continues to be about what happens in those bewitching hours after midnight across the entire community, but in particular in those more urban districts. And so candidly, uh, I, along with two of my colleagues from the previous council, actively pursued legislation that would have closed down businesses after 2 a.m. period um, because of the rash of concerns that we were seeing from residents and so many different people. But after a conversation with Councilmember Jawando, uh, which was very productive and helpful, and the thoughtful meeting that he referenced, which by all accounts was very successful and continues to be a good community building model moving forward, um, I backed off. And uh, as soon as Councilmember Stewart came on board, further proving that she's all in doing reconnaissance work with her staff at 2 a.m. Uh, just a couple weeks ago is really extraordinary. Um, I think this is a very reasonable approach and I do credit the county executive and his team um, who worked diligently with MCPD and the community uh, to engage stakeholders. And not surprisingly, uh, people had different opinions uh, and were coming at this from different angles. 
And so I think option two is reasonable uh, and is nuanced uh, given what is happening on the ground now. And I think takes us another step closer to balancing the need for us to have opportunities for people to be able to let their hair down, but also do it in a manner that's safe and acknowledges the reality that we have right now, which is that we are severely down in the amount of officers who are in a position to be able to cover, um, especially these sometimes most challenging hours of day to cover. And so uh, I think this is reasonable. I also think it's timely. We're about to enter into another summer season, uh, which is when crime tends to rise generally anyways. Um, and so I think it's important for us to enact this now, um, give businesses an opportunity to adjust. And as is always the case, if it doesn't work or things need to be tweaked or adjusted, they will be evaluated and they can be tweaked and adjusted. So uh, it looks like Dr. Yes, yeah, so to I, I wanted to address a couple things. So um, very much appreciate uh, your, your comments on that. And then I think you, you've nailed it correctly. So in the original iteration of the bill, we identify priority areas largely because we need, we felt like we didn't want to include, all, we didn't want to catch every business open between midnight and 5 a, 6 a.m. I think in the original draft up into legislation, figuring priority areas would help address that. With the removal of priority areas, I think you, I, I, I would recommend, and certainly I have spoken to the county executive, and he recommends that we narrow it in some way beyond all businesses between midnight and 5 a.m. While I think we all agree that having businesses do plans is a good thing, and if they did it, you know, voluntarily on their own or opted in, that would be great. Uh, but obviously, with uh, this being the first iteration of of, of an effort like this, uh, the, my preference is the county executive's preference is that we start smaller and build out as deemed necessary by what happens on the ground. As you alluded to, Councilmember Auburn knows our summers tend to be our most um, active times in the late time and that means both in terms of late, late night playing but also in terms of late night uh, uh, issues and so we're we, we will be very introspective and I think a big part of this bill is a reporting requirement about what we do see and I think that data collection process will inform how this body could move forward in the future expanding beyond the hours as deemed now obviously we've you know there are certain businesses that have I'll be candid. There are certain bad actors in this space. Not many, and they are. They are not. Not all businesses are bad. Most businesses are really good, uh, good partners, good community members. They're doing the right thing. Not all business owners, and certainly some are more willing to ignore good practice than others. And I think this this bill should be um, narrowly focused on those businesses that have been the source repetitively of problems, uh, and who. Um, you know, where there just happens to be uh, more issues concentrated in fewer areas, uh, you know, and time frames as we see fit. This will not address countywide crime in any sense of the word. I think we all agree on that. This is meant to narrowly address a specific issue and allow us to focus more. You know, very few people are enjoying late night activities after 2 a.m. Uh, but there are a disproportionate number of issues associated with those fewer people uh, during those time frames based on the, the data we can see. We can see there's very concentrated areas where we see issues late at night that happen to correspond to these businesses. We have heat maps that show that. Um, so I think we're trying to address a very small problem in a less onerous way than simply closing the businesses as you alluded to. And so I think that's certainly where the county executive is. Thank you, that's helpful. Captain? Sir, so I just want to kind of reiterate from, from the community standpoint, when we go to these community meetings, the, the 2 to 5 uh, a.m. is their biggest problem and concern. So in the police uh, side of it, when I look at these reports, when we have the problems between in like some of the hookah bars or something like that, we usually backtrack and we found out that the problem started in a bar that closes at 2 o'clock and then they follow each other over somewhere else and, and the problem escalates. And that's why we wanted the 12 to five because that allows us and our detectives, if it goes into a violent act, then we can backtrack and, uh, and find out what was the main cause, what caused this. Now I can tell you that, and I kind of agreed that it would, it would broaden the businesses if we go to 12. But 
I do believe, and I do a lot of site security surveys, the new Citizens Lounge that's about to open. I would go in, I would talk to them about their security, their cameras, their lighting. A lot of people, a lot of businesses are on board because they understand if certain things happen in their business, it's not John Doe that's reported. It's the business itself that is the problem. And so I want to help alleviate that. So it's not fair to them. It's not fair to that business to be ridiculed for the actions of one person. So a lot of people are, are getting on board. But what I would say as we go into this, and if we do start from two to five, the council to be open, if we do have that one problem establishment that we, we deem it's like you said, is the one bad actor that shuts down at two o'clock, repetitive fights, repetitive actions, they don't want to put up any security cameras, then I think that gives us an opportunity to come back to the drawing board and say, okay, now we need to start adding, um, adding businesses that are not wanting to play by the rules that, that are putting their community in danger. I appreciate that. And there, we do have other tools at our disposal for those that have liquor licenses, for example, which are regulated by the county. So there is another lever that we have to pull. Um, um, but in, in sort of as we phase, hopefully this is it. Um, but if, if this doesn't do what it is intended to, we'll obviously have to reevaluate. But I think this is a reasonable next step. So uh, with that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Vice President Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. I really appreciate all the work. I have participated in some of the meetings, certainly not all of the meetings, really appreciate all the work that has uh, occurred. I, I do remember the uh, very large meeting in downtown Silver Spring that uh, I don't, I don't want to say kicked off some of the uh, more uh, in-depth meetings, but certainly was a galvanizing uh, force uh, to that. So this has been a long time coming. There have been a lot of uh, dynamics here. I, I say that to, to note the fact that I am concerned about this being expanded. And I think that this effort has been going on for many, many months, and there has been significant amounts of engagement with local businesses, working together with the police department, with the executive branch, and I appreciate Dr. Stoddard and the Regional Service Center, and I appreciate uh, council member Stewart as the, the new district council member really you know diving into a train that had already left the station uh, while it was moving and, uh, and 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 fully dedicating to that including very late uh, night uh, efforts uh, which which I very much appreciate and all the work the council member Jawando and, and others have have undertaken but I am very concerned about us after months and months and months of engagement specifically working together with local businesses, expanding it into parts of the county with businesses that haven't been engaged at all, that haven't been part of this conversation, that aren't aware of, of this, that haven't been privy to the productive and constructive conversations that have occurred, and I think would be surprised when this happens. And so I just want to note that I you know, appreciated this, even though you know, I did have some concerns about whether or not we were asking businesses to play the role of law enforcement and public safety and you know working through that issue. And I think there has been a lot of effort to work through collaboratively between the police department and the businesses to make sure that that isn't how it is perceived. Uh, but that is in an, a very specific and targeted place in the county where this was you know, originally, uh, uh, originally focused. So uh, I... Um, Will personally, I, you know, I'll support option two because I think that it is the better of the two options. Uh, but frankly, I'm not really supportive of either, uh, and uh, I don't think I'll be supporting the bill, uh, you know, if it is expanded to a point where it's engaging businesses that have not been part of this process that has gone on for quite a long time, because that does give me uh, significant uh, concerns. But. I, I do appreciate all the work that has taken place. I recognize that we have real challenges and real issues that we need to address and that we need to deal with, and that this bill, as it was introduced and as it has gone through the legislative process, is attempting to address one piece of many other issues, as Dr. Stoddard, you noted, and Captain Reed, uh, you mentioned. This is not going to solve everything. Uh, we have many public safety issues, and we need to provide as much support and tools as we can. Uh, I just think that. Uh, we're asking for folks to be impacted who haven't been engaged if we 
uh, expand this more broadly, and I have some real concerns about that. With that, I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, first off, before I forget, I wanted to publicly thank, and I thanked uh, uh, Chief Jones before, but Captain Reed and Commander McBain have also been directly involved with, with us. And Captain Reed uh, has, has the ability to be extremely um, uh, influential and in when he discusses things with us. And he did do some turnarounds on when I told him that he, he really is into sales, but I, I, I believe option two still is the best. And I, I think that we have, uh, and, and Council President, you said no, no proposal is perfect. Um, Sally will tell you that that's certainly true, that my proposal, but, but I, I um, yeah, it, it is not, not, not perfect. She'll agree with that. But I also believe that, that uh, this is a very good place to begin. And hopefully the changes, uh, with these changes, it changes things that are real and it changes things that are perceptions. And we have both here. We have both. And I think that, that uh, uh, I, I sincerely appreciate Councilmember Juwanda's concern. I think it, it's, it's certainly something that, that we have to keep in mind. Hopefully we will not have that change that, that Captain Reed talked about, that we would have to come back and have those discussions. But I believe option two gives us that ability. I think if we don't go countywide, then at that point, if we have a problem outside of, quote unquote, the priority areas, then we have to come back and write legislation again. And we need the flexibility that, that all of our departments talking to our uh, businesses saying, we want you to be successful, we want to help you be successful, but you've got to change what you're doing to be successful for you and your neighbors and your, and your patrons. I think that makes a lot of sense. So. The Restaurant Association, as Councilmember Stewart has mentioned, is supportive of option two, Silver Spring Chamber. We can go down the list. And I think what Dr. Stoddard said is so very right. The vast majority, the vast majority of businesses want to do the right thing. They want to do the right thing for their patrons. They want to do the right thing for themselves. They want to do the right thing for the, for the uh, neighborhood. They want to do the right thing. And if there's a problem, if there's a problem, and hopefully there's not, they want to do the right thing to correct that for themselves and the neighborhoods and everybody else. And I, I believe that if we start with the two o'clock, and if there's a problem that that's not working, then we need to come back and, and figure out how fast we can change this. This is uh, something that needs to be done, and for the expediting part, uh, this means that the bill, when it passes, if it passes, that it would start immediately. Otherwise, it has to wait. Christine, is it 90 days? And, and we would be way past the summer. We wouldn't even be able to communicate with their businesses and say, look what we're going to do in 180 days, 90 days, whatever it is. And we need to start that right now. And there's nothing that's saying that a business right this second wouldn't have a plan. But we, if, if we do it right away, they'll know exactly what we would like them to do and what we think is the right thing to do. So I'm supportive of option two. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Fana Gonzalez. Yes, uh, thank you for all the work that has taken place to get us to this place. I would say that when I first heard of this the initiative, I was happy. And I decided to talk to different businesses in Wheaton and in Glenmont. I am a district council member, so I'm focused on my district. Um, I went to talk to um, pretty much 90% of, maybe 80% of all of them were immigrant owned businesses who, businesses that open after you know midnight. And I wanted to get their feedback, how they felt about this and how this type of policy will affect them. And let me tell you, my friend, the response was, was actually positive. Every single business that I talk to, think of La Rumba, think of Unplugged, think of um, 
so many I can't keep up. Um, they already have safety plans in place. All of them are already paying for private security already. All of them are telling me we actually have want to have a better relation with the police. So once I heard that, guess what I did? I contacted my friend, Captain Smith. He's a captain for District 4, the police District 4. And I started having meetings with him and the business owners to number one, get to know each other. Number two, uh, have the police also get to know the private company that each of these businesses um, hired. Um, they're all very different. I wish it was one company for everybody, but that's not the case. Um, and, and give them their advice as a police officer, how they can communicate and work better. Um, I do believe, and, and again, um, many of the businesses that I talk to are very different. Like uh, I'm thinking the Irish pub, the Limerick, mm -hmm. that's the one I always go to. And uh, you know, they will be happy with option two because the second part operate anytime between the hours of 12 and two. These guys don't barely have any issues. They won't fall into this. Uh, if, have, if you have been subject of two or more service calls, you know, they're, they're not gonna be affected. I mean, so far, who knows in the future. Um, and the whole thing about the cameras, uh, the business that I talked to, they were like, you know, if you have issues, you can come and get our footage. We want to help you. We don't want to have criminals in our businesses because it affects the business. Okay? So I, all that to tell you that I am for option two. And I, and us, and I think Council Member Katz mentioned this, you know, this thing can be amended, amended in the future. We can try it out. If it doesn't work, you know, consider this a pilot. Uh, and I do believe that it should be expedited, expedited right away, as he mentioned. Uh, the whole point is to, is to have, you know, the summertime is when more things happen. If we wait 90 days, we're gonna lose the important segment of the year when we should have, eaten, have, had, thus, have had this implemented. So uh, option two is for me. And, um, and then the whole thing about having this countywide or in specific areas, um, I do think it should be in specific areas, but I'm going to go with the flow. At the, end, at the end of the day, it doesn't affect me as a district council member because it, it will be my district no matter what. Um, and I thank the county executive for moving this forward and for the police. Um, to, for being a partner on this. That's it. Someone wants to make a motion later on to move it from countywide to specific areas. We can do that. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you everyone involved with this process because I know it's been incredibly tedious. Um, but I've heard several comments here today regarding the timing that I just want to level set expectations because the way this is written, even if it is passed today as emergency legislation, there are 180 days to develop the regulations and then compliance becomes effective 90 days after that. So it is nine months from now. So it is not something or potentially nine months because, you, you know, we could all we could all agree to speed up. Right. But it's not going to be done in June is, is the point. And so, you know, I think it's important that everyone understand that because Everybody's 100% correct. Summer always brings an increase in um, in criminal issues. So uh, that's one. Um, in terms of it being countywide versus location specific, uh, and I argued this at committee, the reason why I argued for it to be countywide, one, an equity issue, two, so that we're not playing catch up. Unfortunately, sometimes when legislation gets passed with great intention to deal with an immediate problem, you aren't aware of the problem that's already brewing somewhere else. And because the legislative process isn't always speedy, um, it seemed better to make it countywide to start. Um, and again, that would largely, because there aren't many places operating between two and five countywide in, in other parts of the county or outside of these priority districts, but um, it would only apply to them in a, in a mandatory capacity if they'd had two serious offenses in the past 12 months. Um, otherwise, there's voluntary participation, and as noted, there's language in here related to um, grant funding for, for that. Um, there's another part. Oh, yes, I was supposed to explain uh, serious offenses and, and talk to that. 
The way this is written, it allows the definition of serious offenses to be designated in the regulations. And one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons why that's there is it can be done with reference to specific portions of the criminal law article for Maryland. And for example, if anyone wanted to take a look in the education article at 7303, the reportable offenses statute that applies to, to K-12 students, um, but does have a kind of the statutory language I would expect to see referenced in um, a regulation related to this where you're focusing on things like serious sexual assaults, first and second degree offenses, weapons related charges and those kinds of things. Um, but that would be up to the multi-body group that is put together as noted um, by Ms. Wellens. It's not, while MCPD may be designated as the lead entity on this, there are other agencies um, that are going to be collaborating with this that can help flesh out um, which of our criminal law provisions would be uh, appropriate to be included in that definition of uh, serious offenses. Um, why MCPD? Ah, yes, because, <laughs> because of your knowledge, experience, uh, expertise in risk management and in understanding these areas and what types of things have been happening in and around the community. And also with respect to the other entities that we have pulled into the fold in the, in the um, proposed amendments that you have here that passed out of committee, um, MCPD is the entity that has experience in crime prevention through environmental design. That's your wheelhouse. That's not something that's in the wheelhouse of the other entities. Um, so again, it's meant to be collaborative and, um, and incorporate all the sort of different entities that, um, that would have information that would help bear on how, what should be included in these plans. And correct me if I'm wrong, Captain Reed, but as I said at committee, these are not war and peace length plans. This is a, this is a, a template that will be provided um, to make sure everyone is covering the appropriate things that need to be assessed for a facility. And that this applies to, um, and also to clarify that the serious offenses language, um, that you made it clear that that was not just for things that happened inside a facility, but would apply where something started brewing in the facility and went outside. That's correct. The, okay. uh, again, as the lead law enforcement agency, we understand the partnership working with ABS, ATC, DHSS for loud noises. We, we've been doing this for months, over a year, working with our business compliance checks. We've been on the ground, but we also know the background, the calls for service, the violence that we see, and we bring those entities. And we also sprinkle in a little community engagement. We want to see them succeed, mm -hmm. but in order for them to succeed, they had to listen to us. And I think everything we have done in downtown Silver Spring, all the violence that w was noted two years ago, we don't have that right now. I mean, there there is always gonna be crime, but their officers are making on-scene arrests as they happen. And a lot of times that is in partnership with the business owners that have listened to us, that their security staff work with law enforcement, hire additional part-time police officers, have cameras that we can go back and look at. All of those are selling points to these other businesses. This is what we can attain. And you throw on a placard that I am working with law enforcement to make you safe in my establishment, please come. And that's what we wanna help with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, President Glass. Just had a quick question. If the bill was expanded to midnight, how many additional businesses would be included that are operating between 12 and 5? We attempted to assess this, but not knowing exactly the hours of certain uh, alcohol establishments, it was not possible to get a firm number, mm -hmm. but it would, be an, it would be several orders of magnitude more businesses. So whereas it's probably 20 to 30, I think that's been alluded to already, it would probably be well over 100. Um, that would be, that would be, that have some number of hours between midnight and 12 or 2 a.m. Many businesses don't open, aren't, aren't uniform hours at all times of the year and all days of the week. And so it'd be very different. We have to go back and look at each individual business of which, you know, apply, but it would be uh, two, three, four, five times as many businesses. Thank you. That is also what we um, I located too, and through our investigation, is sometimes 
the hours change on businesses. Sometimes they're open Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sometimes they open Saturday, Sunday. Sometimes they open from 12 to 3. Sometimes they open from 3 to 7. I mean, it's like it's very hard in our business compliance checks. Where we would plan on, okay, we're going to go down this street planning on these business being open yeah. with our clothes now. And so that's where it was a little bit frustrating for us as and through our research, the hours were just all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it, it was almost like pop-up events where they would send out, you know, through th social media, hey, we're going to be open now. And then everybody would come in. Our officers are completely understaffed because they don't know. I mean, I have videos and footage that I have, uh, I have shown Chief Jones where all of a sudden a pop-up event happens, there's 300 people that just showed up mm -hmm. and I've got five cops working. Mm -hmm. And so this was where this legislation is really going to help us because it makes these business owners, especially the ones that haven't really worked with us in the past, say, hey, just to let you know, we have this large event and it gives me a week to plan, bring in additional resources so this doesn't scatter into the neighborhood. People get hurt, people run out in the middle of the street, get hit by a car. It just allows us to plan and work with the business owners. I think it would be helpful since um, we've all agreed that this is somewhat of an, a pilot um, that we review this in a year and see if we need to expand the locations to include businesses operating between 12 and 2 a.m. just to ensure that um, our officers are not um, overwhelmed with this pilot and with the response that's needed to get this off the ground. We have nine months before, you know, full implementation. And so I think it would be helpful to start off slow. And then if we need to ramp up after a year of evaluating what the success rate is, what crime looks like, then we can think about expanding, but want to make sure you have enough um, support to get started in this. Yes, ma'am. And also just to let the council know, sometimes you'll talk to a business, they'll say, we stopped serving at two o'clock. Yeah, but they don't really close until three. So that's other things we have to keep in mind too, if you mm -hmm. want to do between uh, two and five and say, what time do you stop serving alcohol? Yeah, we're done at two o'clock. Well, that doesn't mean they close at two o'clock. They're still open until three and then everybody leaves. So these, these are things you gotta keep in mind too. Okay. We will obviously have a summer this summer during which we can collect some data and information yes. and be willing to, we're absolutely willing to have some reporting back to the council in the fall about what we saw this summer and okay. then we can have a further discussion. The bill also to council member sales' question does include an annual reporting requirement. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm just gonna jump in real quick. Uh, Captain Reed, I appreciate what you just shared. Um, and I think there's a lot to unpack in that. Um, one, if there's pop-up nature uh, events, it's hard to pinpoint it at any time. So trying to even define a time between 12 and 5 would be hard under those parameters. Um, and so there is a, a whack-a-mole uh, approach that we all acknowledge. And uh, the committee made the determination that going countywide is the best way to try to mitigate that rather than have a tightly defined area where we know the problems currently um, are occurring. With respect to the scenarios of uh, after parties, um, I think as Council Member Alberna has said, as others have said, we have liquor laws. And the liquor laws clearly state that no sales are to occur after 2 a.m. And if there is a business that is selling alcohol after 2 a.m., that is the remedy, the revocation of the liquor license, the whatever next steps need to occur um, to encourage them to be better neighbors and trying to find another remedy when one is already there, not in local law, but in state law because liquor licenses are provided by the state. I think that's what we need to look at. And under those other scenarios where people might be lingering, after three, if it's after, I'm sorry, after two, if it's after two, it's after two. And that's what option two provides for. I think there are remedies before us that already exist. And what we're trying to do through this process is make the, the areas, the businesses and the patrons um, have a safer environment for those that are not currently operating within statute. 
with that, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. I just want to just encourage us to step back and reframe this. You know, to uh, Council Member Fang Gonzalez brought up an important point when I thought you were coming my way when you started to say say what you were saying. <laughs> when you when you said that like the businesses one have the plans, wanted to do them, and some of those are businesses that aren't open after two uh, that you mentioned. It, the this is a good thing. Like we want these plans to be developed, and I, you know, I just I think we need to think about. The points that have been made by we we tried really hard working with the administration to find out who what are the businesses open between 12 and 5 and what are the businesses open between 2 and 5 we weren't able to nail that down specifically so that obviously needs to be there needs to be some work done on that and it's always going to everything's a moving target nothing is anything we do is is ex exact our vacancy rate isn't exact at any one moment in time either so um but we could have a pretty good sense but one thing i do know is that there are not many businesses open between two and five. Um, and, and I know that the vast, vast majority, if not, you know, I'm not gonna say all because you, you never know all, but the vast majority of them are immigrant owned, black and brown owned businesses who are not the driver of our state crime and safety problems. And so what we're saying here is we're gonna pilot something on the backs of those businesses, which are not the main driver in the hopes that it will produce something. I think we're looking at it the wrong way. It's good to have these safety plans. Let's just encourage everyone to have a safety plan and work with them over a period of time to do so. If you're open after 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. rather. Um, I, I, just, I, I just cannot emphasize enough that uh, this is one, not gonna solve the problem, and two, not, e not effective, and three, uh, it's not equitable. It's discriminatory, in fact. Um, and so it's on all on all measures. It just doesn't work. Cap, uh, Captain Reed talked about uh, the let out. You know, we all know I grew up. We called it the let out. When, when you come out of a place and you have to be have your head on a swivel because you're worried about something that could happen because there's people who are intoxicated or, or a very minority, small minority of people who want to cause trouble or get into a fight or get, carry on a disagreement that happened inside the bar. <laughs> God bless you. Many of these, as you mentioned, issues are a result of that. The shooting we had at Pike and Rose a few weeks ago, 1150 police dispatched, 1150 p.m., a.m., p.m., p.m. So if we're gonna solve the problem, let's solve the problem. Let's not, let's not target 30 businesses that are immigrant-owned businesses and say we've solved the problem. We're not, we're not doing it. And, and you know, I won't ultimately be able to support it if we go in that direction, but I just, let's not, Let's not confuse it. I want the public to be very clear that these, are, these businesses are not the main, they don't serve alcohol. The businesses that will be covered under this plan, absent the serious incidents, which I think is still a little murky, are businesses that don't serve alcohol, are not allowed to serve alcohol, um, and that are primarily uh, immigrant, black and brown owned, and are not the main driver of our violence problems. So that's what this bill would reduce this scope to, and I just think that's wrong and it's not effective. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. I appreciate the conversation and everybody's work on this. Um, I know it's been, it's been a lot of going back and forth, um, but I know that everybody is um, dedicated to coming to uh, uh, the best solution that we possibly can. And I appreciate all the, all of the hands and the input that have been in that. Um, the, you know, it was, it was a, a long conversation at the at committee also, and you can see, I'm sure why we ended up bringing some decision points back to the full council here. There's, there's not an obvious solution and we're dealing with a difficult issue. Um, I, and, and take note of this because maybe you don't hear it that often. Um, as, as with uh, Vice President Friedson, I agree <laughs> that, that uh, neither option one nor option two is perfect here. Um, <clears throat> and I think, again, that's why this ended up back at the council. We were really debating between, um, uh, you know, trying to find the, the right balance to include the right number of businesses. We're balancing that with the capacity um, of the executive branch to, to handle that. We're balancing that with um, a burden on businesses and, um, and trying to figure out what are the measures that we can, what are the measures that we can implement to, to limit the number of businesses. 
Um, and, you know, as you can see, the committee was not comfortable limiting by geography. So that was one potential measure that was out. So then we're looking at limiting by time. And as you've heard from Councilmember Jawando, as, you, as you've heard from Captain Reed, um, that's problematic for various reasons as well. We are potentially missing some businesses that should be included if, if, we, if we limit the time frame. Um, I agree that the, the serious incidents um, is going to be a, a headache uh, to try to figure out exactly what that means because now we're looking at, um, although you can list particular crimes that it falls under, we're talking about crimes that have not been tried in a court of law. So there's going to be debate there, there's going to be argument, did something start, in fact, start inside a business or did it start outside? There's just haggling that could happen over these things. There's going to be people who get upset, whether it's, you know, the business or the people, are there implications there? Um, if, you know, if the, uh, if an officer makes an assessment that it happened, you know, here versus there, now does that have implications for the prosecution of that case and whether or not that person is going to be uh, you know, found found guilty for some particular. So there's just a, a lot of complicated implications that start happening when you introduce um, uh, when you introduce the serious incident clause. Um, uh, and so my leaning, while I feel like neither again neither of these is perfect, my preference is for option one um, for those reasons. And I, you know, the main concern that I'm hearing there is that from uh, from 12 to 2, if we introduce 12 to 2 blanket for everyone, that that is a significant number of uh, additional businesses. So my question then is, um, you know, what exactly is the burden on the businesses and the burden on the executive branch? I know we're talking specifically about the officers. And so my thinking there is, you're telling us that you can handle that. And additionally, that, um, you know, in conversation with the committee about what, what is the burden on these businesses, that the that the hope is to give them a a form that's easy to fill out to make this as easy as possible and implementation as easy as possible and if they're not a business that is um uh you know that is particularly problematic in this way then in order to their safety plan doesn't need to be particularly complex it can just be notifying uh you know being clear about what their hours are or you know whatever the case may be um but for you know if many of those businesses are uh, not facing a problem, then for this to really just be a very simple turning in, uh, turning in of a form, um, and so for that reason, I think that option one is the is the preferable option between the two. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Final word, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you all. Um, I know that many people have been working on this for a long time, and and I appreciate that. And I was first made aware of it uh, back uh, before I was here uh, working with a fellow chamber, Chamber of Commerce. Um, so clearly the regulation is the key to this and I think it's really important as the regulation is developed uh, that, uh, that, it, that it ties up a lot of the loose ends that you're hearing today um, and particularly the serious incident, the definition of serious incidents, what is that? Appreciate uh, Councilmember uh, Mink's point about uh, when does one serious incident begin and where does it begin? Because I, I'm sure you would agree that it tends to move um, uh, ge geographically where a serious incident takes place. Um, I do support uh, the uh, businesses that are open from two to five. I, I support option two, partly because of the scope, but uh, but also because of the existing alcohol laws. If, if we want to focus on establishments with beer, wine, alcohol licenses that are open until two, we should do that through the existing alcohol, uh, the ABS laws. Um, but, I'm, but I'm okay with focusing on the open two to five. And, and part of that is because of the scope. Um, given the limited resources, uh, I think that, um, that that is a reasonable way to, to, to do it. Um, and I'm also okay with countywide. Uh, I don't know if there are any establishes, establishments in my district that are open from two to five. Uh, if there are, uh, my office is very happy to work with them to make sure that, they're, um, that, they, are, that they have a plan in place um, and, and move forward. I, I agree that it's not going to solve all the issues of the, of the bad things that happen after midnight. Uh, but I think it's one important tool in the toolbox. My final, final point is um, notification to businesses. 
Um, this is a this is an ongoing issue that when the county passes laws that businesses are required to comply with, the county needs to make sure not only that they notify the businesses, but also to help with compliance. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and that, um, I yield. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, Ms. Wellens. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Just wanted to note regarding the precise language of option two, wanted to make sure that everyone is on the same page since it seems as though folks are, you know, leaning towards that option. On page five of the staff memorandum, you can see um, the amendment that was before the Public Safety Committee and in terms of where the serious incidents occurred as presented to the Public Safety Committee, it was incidents occurring on the premises of the business. However, uh, my understanding, and they will correct me if I'm wrong, but that, council, that Chair Katz and Councilmember Lukey's preference was for staff to then work with uh, Dr. Stoddard to incorporate language saying that if it originates, if the incident originates on the premises, that that, that too would fall under this ambit. So you'll see then on page six of the staff memorandum where Dr. Stoddard raised the um, possibility of including the language um, that the serious incident would originate, would occur on the premises or originate from the premises. So I believe that's what the option two that the council is uh, deciding. So just wanted to make that clear. And I will add just, you know, for what it's worth, I do think it's a very valid, you know, as multiple council members have, have stated, you know, the regulations are very important because this could be a very messy factual inquiry, inquiry of where did an incident occur. So I do anticipate that administratively that does make it more complicated. Thank you for that. Councilman Mink has a very quick question. Thank you. I just wanted to check. I know that there is a, a um, an amendment later that allows for an appeal mm -hmm. if the late night. And so uh, for this part, is there is there appeal or would folks consider allowing businesses to appeal if they are designated a late night business through this through this option? So that option. that's a secondary issue. Let's just do, let's just right now vote on option one and option two. Well, this is a question about option two. This would be a if piece option, of option two, two. If option two is adopted, then you can bring that up to amend the law, uh, amend the legislation that's before us procedurally. So okay. I'm going to ask you to put to. Okay to hold on to that. Okay. Uh, so two options are before us, option one and option two that are in our packet and that were just uh, articulated uh, by Ms. Wellens. All those in support of option one, raise your hand. That is two. Uh, all those in support of option two, and that is nine. Option two is adopted. Uh, Councilman Rank, I'll turn it back over to you if you have a thought yes. or suggestion. Yes. Um, as a uh, potential way to help alleviate some of the concerns that's expressed um, around option two, which I know that uh, that we have we talked about that neither are perfect, but we but I understand that the council's moving with option two. That's fine. Um, but a suggestion there to consider um, allowing businesses to uh, to appeal in the same way that they are uh, that it's the bill has been amended to allow them to to appeal if their um, uh, late night safety plan itself is rejected. Can they could they be allowed to appeal? if they are deemed a late night business due to the um, uh, you know, serious incidents piece of this. And so I, 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 I turn that over to council members. Can I ask what the motion is? What are you proposing? Okay. You, you uh, asked a question, sure, so if you sure, want to sure. make a proposal. Sure, uh, I'll make a motion to uh, amend um, option two to add the ability for businesses that um, are deemed late night businesses under the serious incident uh, clause to allow them to appeal that designation. Is there a second? Seconded, uh, moved by Council Member Mink, seconded by Council Member Jawando. Uh, Council Member Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, based on the fact that this would relate to an appeal and based on the fact that there is a subsequent section of the packet that deals specifically with appeals um, with a recommended amendment. I would ask that we table council member Mink's motion at this time so that we can deal with all things appeal related at the same time because I believe the motion made would require changing language to um, on your packet page nine subsection F appeals. So Does let me let me uh, 
ask Ms. Wellens, I see that the issue that we just took up between option one and two uh, were the only dis discussion points that you highlighted. Are there any others that you would like to highlight for a full council decision? There was one other um, relatively minor issue I was gonna bring up for the full council decision. Um, and council member Lukey is of course correct that it, the, the relevant language that we're discussing right at the moment is at the bottom of page nine of the staff packet. So I believe that the amendment would, uh, you know, be fairly easy to draft, that it would be a late night business may appeal the disapproval of a plan or the determination by the department that the business is a late night business. I could word that a little yeah. bit better. Or just um, like classification as a late yeah. night business. Yeah. So um, but I think the substance of the of the proposed amendment is is clear, and um, if the council wants to go in that direction, I think we could certainly. It would be just amending the committee recommendation. Understood. Um, uh, let me let me ask Dr. Stoddart. Uh, we would have no objections to that as a as an appeal process. Well, so so, yeah. but let's talk through the process, yeah. right? Which we've all identified is really important. Uh, a, a business between twelve and five is going to be required to submit a safety plan and one Between that's two, a, and, two and five. I, I, thank you. <laughs> two to five and 12 to two should there be two incidents um, that will be defined in regulation. When these are submitted, what does, uh, what does the executive branch uh, intend to do? Is it the start of a conversation that is in, sense, in, in essence a negotiation? Um, or is it a pass-fail where then it gets sent back to uh, be We remediated? would be collaborating with the business. That's the intent is to, to uh, encourage the, the participation in a process as opposed to being, like they'll have to provide a plan, but we'll work with them to produce a compliant plan. If we say, hey, you really need to do X, Y, and Z, and they say no, that's the only time in which they would go potentially have a rejected plan. If, if we said, hey, you, you know, this, this exit you have is routinely blocked. And they're like, well, we can't fix that because of X, Y, and Z. That, that would be a place where we'd have an impasse that would, that would result in a failed play, yeah. Uh, that is the answer I was hoping for. Right. Uh, this is a conversation. And it is a conversation about how businesses operating uh, in these hours are good neighbors um, to the community and to their patrons. And if what they're proposing um, does not improve safety, then you would tell them that. And you would tell them where they need and how they need to improve the situation. Um, and so I'm not sure that an actual appeal is necessary because I would hope it didn't, it wouldn't get to that point. So the one situation where this, I think where council member Mink, and I apologize if I'm putting words here, but I think if, you know, for example, there were a business there where, let's say we, we uh, this has been public, so I don't think there's any, about a month ago, we had a serious incident that started uh, in an establishment that resulted in uh, a non-contact shooting. Uh, I believe it was in Councilmember Friedson's district. Um, and uh, the business that it originated in ceased the sale of alcohol for a week, basically recognizing that it was, you know, there had been issues in their establishment. And so that would qualify as a serious incident that would initiate in, in that establishment. Supposing that there was another one a later, so so I think I see your look of confusion. There was a there was a conflict that started inside their establishment that spilled out and resulted in a non-contact shooting outside of their establishment, um, based on some issues that started there. If there were another such, such incident in that same establishment in the, in a year period, we would go to that business and say, hey, based on this clause within this bill, you're now subject to the this regulation, that business may say, oh no, this second incident wasn't a serious incident and here's why, that would be an, that would be an appealable process for them at that point. So thank you for that. I'm gonna ask the sponsor of, uh, to clarify because I, I was not, un, I, was, I did not understand the motion to be, to appeal whether they have to create a document. It was whether or not the document they created uh, was good enough. Can you clarify the motion? Yeah, so this was, this was um, as, as Dr. Stoddard described, so this would be to, to appeal whether or not they should be designated as a late night business based Understood. on the two serious incidents. In theory, it would be both because it already required, it already allows them if, if, if their plan is denied to go to the Port of Appeals. Understood. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, 
it's the right way to do uh, to go about this. I think that if a business uh, feels that they're that they want to do the right thing, but they've been unjustly accused, they should be able to appeal it. Uh, it this is a matter of us getting a business to feel comfortable to do the right thing, and I think an appeal is is the right way to go. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Agreed. I seconded the motion. I'll support it. I, I think it's important to note here that the bill was amended to say that you can shut down the business if the plan is not approved. So this is not a paper tiger. Uh, as, as much of a conversation we all would hope that it is, the language says a person must not operate a late night business between the hours of midnight and 5 p.m. and this two and two to five now uh, without first submitting a proposed late night uh, business safety plan that it has to be approved. If it's disapproved, uh, that uh, the department provides written notice, in this case, police department, that it's disapproved. And then you can't operate the business. You still own it, but you can't operate it, which means you can't, you know, you're going to go out of business. So uh, is that correct, Ms. Wellens, just so I'm clear? Right. You wouldn't be able to, once you receive the written disapproval from the department, you would not be able to operate during those hours. Right. So and that would be appealable. Yeah. Right. And, and so there was discussion as we were developing this bill, but also in committee discussion about what we really want to do here is which which is why I think it's it was better to have it be more inclusive is create a conversation between everyone who's involved in creating community safety. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a role that de the permitting plays. There's a role that the police play. There's a role that the business plays and et cetera, et cetera. And then you come to a good place with a good plan. But ultimately, under the bill, if the police under the regulations that they put forward are not happy with the plan, they can shut down the business. So in that case, you absolutely must have an appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not that's you know, you have to have an appeal both to the approval or disapproval of the plan, but also to whether you're designated as an entity. So I, we have to support both in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Ludke. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to clarify because I read it like six times trying to make sure all the parts meet up with one another and if you know once all the different distinguishing um, choices are made today um, as noted the the transition or the start for existing businesses has a, a pretty long runway under under when this would happen and really the the portion um, that's on under section 12 of the staff packet on page 13 uh, about not operating a late night business if you don't have um, a late night business safety plan um, would be uh, only for new businesses, right? So because they wouldn't be able to start operating until they had that. For our existing businesses, there's this time period, collaborative time period in which the regulations are being drafted, in which everything is getting up and running for them to be able to submit and then get approval. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, that no one, no one by operation of approving this bill today would be s s prevented from operating their business once it becomes effective. Okay, um, so there is a motion on the floor, all those in support of that motion, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wellens, any other items that you think we need um, to be addressed? The one relatively, uh, in this grand scheme of things, relatively minor um, item is if you look at page 10 of the staff memorandum where there is a requirement um, under the bill as originally drafted to, and, and, and would be retained by the Public Safety Committee's proposal, would be that if you are a business that is required to do video surveillance under an approved plan, then you need to post a notice. Um, that's great. The question is, uh, sh uh, should the notice say that the business is subject to, quote, 24-hour video surveillance monitoring, or would it be better just to delete the term 24-hour? Uh, and Council Member Lukey had identified this as an issue. I think it's a good clarification. Thank Council you. Member Lukey, you want to clarify? Yes, I just uh, I thought it was more important to just say that it's subject to video surveillance monitoring and does not specify a time period. And I can I I realize I forgot to share this with Ms. Wellens before uh, before today's hearing. Um, but as a separate issue, I would move to add a provision that makes it abundantly clear that these late night business safety plans are not subject to the Public Information Act. 
because there would be a compromise in the safety and security of operations of a business if these were able to be requested under the MPIA. Um, it's really no different than there are other provisions in the MPIA that already exclude emergency plan and, and other types of safety and security documents from being able to be requested by the public. Thanks. Uh, so I heard the second, but uh, first, uh, uh, regarding the surveillance duration, does that require any action on, on our part, or is that just a clarification that you were just making? Uh, that would require the council to adopt there that change. Go. Move to delete 24 hour. There you go. That's the motion I was expecting you to make. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, moved by Council Member Ludke, seconded by Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Any comments? Uh, all those in favor of that motion? Very good. Uh, and I think you have another motion. My second motion is to add a provision that exempts uh, these late night safety plans from the requirements of the MPIA. Uh, and that was seconded by Council Member Katz. Mr. President, could I just clarify, and, and this is a, a perhaps a question to Council Member Lukey, but whether the amendment would read that essentially that it's uh, the council's intent that these are, you know, deemed uh, e exempt as opposed to just absolutely that they are exempt. Right. So it, um, it, it would, you could cite to the cross provision in the general okay. provisions article that relates to this class of documents, right. um, but as long as it just spells it out in here so that there's no misunderstanding um, and, you know, so that our business community knows that their safety plans are protected. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sales. Yeah, I just had a question about the recent motion. Um, given that there is an appeals process, if uh, business um, thinks that the appeal, um, thinks that the reason that they were cited was incorrect and they want to assess um, other, um, uh, I guess, safety plans and evaluate their safety plan against another business that may have been approved. Um, I'm just wondering if that um, sort of creates a barrier and um, I know that there are concerns with the public being able to access how you're keeping your business safe but then are we putting ourselves in a position to potentially disproportionately um, cite certain businesses for being in violation when plans could be um, maybe even similar to each other and so I'm just wondering if there could be an opportunity for um, I think that's a really excellent point and I'm trying to uh, think it through in real time which is always dangerous but I do think that um, that could be highly relevant information for whether there was you know for example a discriminatory application yes. um, so I don't I don't think this would foreclose even if 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 under the Public Information Act you were not able to access another business's plan as a general matter I don't think that would foreclose that if you were in an appeal posture that you could demand rele the relevant information for your appeal but mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that that would mean then that the Board of Appeals would need to uh, potentially meet in sort a closed fashion in order mm -hmm. to evaluate Disclose, so yeah. I know I'm speaking in circles here but mm -hmm. I I do think perhaps that could be addressed in regulations to say look the intent is not to prevent you from being able to tell you know to gather the relevant information it and it could be that you're gathering the information not I'm going to look at my competitors business plan per se but I am entitled to information from the police department about how many businesses and in what circumstances have been required to do x y or z exactly um, and so that that or and or you know private proprietary information you know mm -hmm. could perhaps be redacted so I think there are, there are ways to yes. handle it and to ensure that there that businesses can adequately defend themselves in an appeal or adequately represent themselves but it might need to be through 
yeah. regulation. I don't know if Dr. Stoddard has I any this it, 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 on this. I think what you're suggesting is reasonable. I think we just have to figure out exactly how the mechanism, because I think it's totally reasonable that one business understand that they're not being held to a standard that other yes. businesses are not being held exactly. to. Uh, but obviously, I think a redacted plan where it's de-identified from the the individual business for whom it's being provided, I think is a reasonable way to, to keep it, uh, you know, to prevent that from happening. So uh, we can we can certainly address that in regulations. I've made a note here, so. Um, I, I think it could also be a component of the annual reporting of, you know, like what types of businesses are being required to do what, under what circumstances, what are the Maybe components Maybe resubmit of these a business plan that was rejected, how many were rejected. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, really good point. Uh, there is a motion on the floor, uh, but I will circle back to say that, that the point you raised, it's a good one and it's part of the reason why these plans need to be submitted to one central uh, authorizing body and decentralizing it to different regional service directors or some other type of uh, group of individuals would further reinforce a, a different perceptions and different application. Uh, so having the county executive or whomever that designee might be uh, having one thought throughout the process, but there are certainly reporting mechanics uh, to further get that information. Uh, uh, Councilmember Ludke, regarding the motion? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that, you know, in, in my experience, and Dr. Stoddard and Captain Reed, you can speak to this, but typically entities that are required to do these types of plans often cross-collaborate when they're developing the plans and, and, and share and try to talk through and roundtable that together. So. Um, I would expect that that would continue. And of course, any business could voluntarily share it with another business if they chose to, right, to be helpful. And, and again, typically this is a very collaborative type of process. Um, but should there be litigation over some kind of discriminatory uh, practice, um, those documents would be able to be produced in the litigation. There would be additional there are additional uh, protective measures that the courts can take or that the Board of Appeals can take in terms of shielding any sensitive information should that arise, but it would not and you know, does not now even now under uh, other documents that are not to be disclosed under the Maryland Public Information Act preclude those from being shared or disclosed in litigation. That, that still happens, so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Good points, everyone. Um, recognizing that, it, and recognizing that that's a that's certainly an um, absolutely valid concern. Um, I also have real hesitation about um, shutting down the ability to MPA things, be just in general, um, because you know the the other businesses have an interest, the public has an interest, um, and so I just want to make sure that we address this concern, but also in a very thoughtful way. And I'm just saying that personally, I haven't gotten to think through all of the potential ramifications here. Um, so uh, Ms. Wellens, is this an issue that as a whole could be addressed in its entirety in the method to regulations as opposed to through an, an amendment to the bill right now? I believe it could be. And I, I would just add to that we can't, um, that the wording would not preclude anyone from submitting an MPIA and at the end of the day we have to do whatever the MPIA mm -hmm. says as opposed to um, our bill. Um, so I would view this amendment as more as expressing the intent so that everybody's aware there's this expectation that these plans are generally exempt from disclosure under the MPIA because of their security and proprietary nature but that would not um, you know if it, if then the police department in consultation with OCA says, oh no, under the MPIA, we really do have to disclose this. Mm -hmm. They would still do that. This bill would not preclude them from doing it. But to your original question, yes, I think it probably could be addressed in regulations if needed. Okay, if it could be addressed in, in regulations, then my, my preference just be out of great respect for you know the the um well the, the respect that we all have for the public's right to to seek knowledge about what's going on in, in government um but still retaining the ability for us to address this this issue my preference would be to leave this to method two just to give us a little more time to really dive in and do a thorough job on this and to request that the that the county executive make sure that this uh, that when the method two comes back that this is uh, thoroughly addressed 
Councilmember Jawanda. Yeah, Ms. Wellens, you, you read my mind. I was just going to say we have to comply with the MPIA. I mean, obviously, there could be ways if there are security information that could be blacked out. There's a lot of ways it could come out. The, 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 the uh, business owner themselves could, could show it and say, hey, you know, my plan wasn't approved. So um, I, I, I appreciate the intent. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, that would be my preference too. what Councilmember Mink said. But I'm, I'm not, a, you know, belts and suspenders just saying, hey, we know that we want the MP, MPIA to apply <laughs> is, is never a bad thing. So, uh, I'll say from my own perspective, I, we should always err on the side of transparency. And the whole purpose of this legislation is to make our businesses and community feel safer. And God forbid there is an incident that occurs, I think people would want to see what the plan was. And if that uh, would then violate the spirit of the intention, I think that that's problematic for me. And so if, if this could be addressed in some way in regulation with, uh, without having an amendment, I'm hearing it could be. Yeah, there are, I mean, so we do this at the county level, just so we're clear. We have facility emergency action plans for all of our county buildings, which are, uh, you know, administered within the Office of Emergency Management, where we, you know, tells you the evacuation routes, where your rally points are, uh, you know, what the, you know, where the general, you know, entry points are, what the understanding that they have the appropriate security that they're locked, things of that nature. And so, um, and the way we handle this with those kinds of documents is we, we, we end up redacting some of the information out of them for any release because while the general tone and tenor of a plan is totally reasonable, you don't necessarily want to know which entrances are covered by a camera and which are not because obviously if you're a bad actor, that's information that's incredibly valuable. If you were going to rob one of these businesses during the off hours, knowing which entrances were covered by cameras would be an incredibly helpful piece of information. And so I think there are certain pieces of information that should be restricted or redacted uh, from a public release for the safety and security of it. You wouldn't want to make the business less safe by virtue of them having to do this public document. But there certainly is a, a fair and reasonable balance that can be achieved in, in being transparent while not impugning the safety of the building. And uh, Ms. Wellens, the motion, the amendment uh, as presented, uh, does it need to be presented in that way or adopted in order to meet the goals that, Ms., uh, that Dr. Stoddart stated? I believe the goals could be achieved through regulation and also just through application of the Maryland Public Information Act itself. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Ludke or Chair Katz, does that change your motion? Do you still want us to vote on it? You don't have to. I mean, the, under the existing MPIA, these are covered, right? So it was a re the motion was to request a cross reference to it to make it clear. But the law is the law; it already applies. So I can withdraw the motion. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any other comments from colleagues at this point, uh, and having had very thorough discussion on this, uh, I am going to ask uh, Councilmember Mink. So sorry. Um, I wanted to raise an amendment that was actually brought previously by um, Chair Katz and Council Members uh, Stewart and Jawando and Council President Glass um, for a discussion at the full council, if possible. I know we want to keep it brief, um, but it just expands. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't create any limitations. It expands the county executive's ability to potentially pivot as needed as, as the parts are moving. So what it does is to. Um, say that the department that is going to make the deciding, uh, that make the decision around um, whether a late night safety plan is accepted, it can be, uh, it can be the police, it can also be, you know, another department as designated. Um, and so that was a, an amendment that I, that I support and I would um, move to bring that back. The exact language is um, department means the office of the county executive or one or more offices or departments designated by the county executive. And I think that just allows for a little more flexibility, especially as we're acknowledging that pieces could be moving here, moving forward. Thanks. Okay, motion made by Council Member Mink. I'll second. Seconded by Council Member Stewart. Any conversation? I can, I can speak to it, sorry. <laughs> I, it. I, I second it. And um, I just think it gives more flexibility as we're moving forward. One of the amendments that was accepted by the committee was pulling in other departments um, in the county to develop these safety plans. And ultimately, the language of the amendment does leave it up to the county exec's office to uh, make this decision. So 
um, it's, it's just another way of, of reviewing and seeing like where is the best place for this process to reside. So I would support the amendment. I, I supported the amendment in committee, and if we want to make sure that this law is applied fairly and equitably uh, in the eyes of people who are reviewing it, then it needs to be one central person or one central office that's doing that reviewing, and this is the best way to do that. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I too will support it. I believe that when during the discussion that we had, uh, we felt that the police had the capacity to do it uh, immediately. Um, and but I do believe that it's ultimately should be the county executive's decision. There was some question whether the the uh, the community uh, it's uh, the the uh, uh, that, that it'd be done in, in in other ways with other departments. But somebody needs to be in charge. So I, I I'm fine with this, and and I think ultimately the county executive in the very beginning is going to have the police do it anyhow. Thank you. Very good. Councilmember Jawanda. Yeah, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, and I want to ask Dr. Stoddard briefly. The way this, I think, would work best is a conversation with the multiple agencies that are involved in community safety, which is not just police. The um, intent that I had from, well, the county executive, I should say, I mean, in conversation. You work for him, so. Yes. <laughs> the intent that we had uh, going into this was for it to be a panel review process that I was going to be directly involved in anyway, so this would not change that so substantively. And, and I think that so so we support this change, but just so we're clear. But yes, it would it was it's going to be a joint review process with all of the agencies as defined by the bill uh, to make sure that we're all reviewing it because you're exactly correct. The police have a huge part in community safety, but as we've said with the businesses, there are many other partners involved in that process. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Ludke. I just want to get some clarification because there are two different pieces in the draft. One that talks about the different collaborative entities that are supposed to work together on this, but there's a separate provision that puts the Department of Police in charge of that. And I want to clarify that this motion is to swap out the police and put it in the county executive hands. Is that correct? Okay, and the county executive can in fact designate MCPD as the primary authority, correct? Okay, just wanted to double check. Thank you. Very good, there's a motion on the floor. All those in favor of the amendment, and that is unanimous. I'm looking around, no other comments made. Um, uh, <laughs> important conversation. Um, Captain Reed, Dr. Starter, thank you uh, for sharing your thoughts and insights. Uh, Ms. Wellens, as always, thank you. Um, and with that, Madam Clerk, uh, can you call the roll? A motion first. Uh, uh, yeah, it's been amended. You're right. Is, there a, is there a motion? <laughs> motion to approve as amended. Moved Second. By, uh, moved by Councilmember Ludke, seconded by Councilmember Sales. Um, please call the roll. Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? No. Councilmember Jawando votes no. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Yes. Councilmember Friesen? No. Councilmember Friesen votes no. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. That is nine to two. Um, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you both again, and thank you, Ms. Wellens. Uh, next is expedited bill work, uh, final reading on expedited bill 3022, buildings, demolition or removal. The Economic Development Committee recommends enactment with amendments. I'll turn it over to the Chair of the Economic Development Committee. Yes, um, this is actually a very straightforward bill. Um, shouldn't require too much comments. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> bill 30, 22, 6 to amend section 8-27 of the code titled Demolition or Removal of Buildings. The purpose of this bill is to address situations where buildings can be substantially removed except for a small wall, yet enabling people to avoid the need for a demolition permit. On that side, a contractor can then rebuild what is for all practical purposes as new home, which then can market and sell 
uh, as such without having to obtain a permit for new constructions. Instead, the permit they do apply for is one of for alternations or renovations. When this happens, the contractor is not required to provide a guarantee for a new home. This bill was actually introduced in the previous council, and then when this new council showed up in December, our amazing council member, Marilyn Balcom, said, let's rescue it, and she decided to move it forward. Um, the bill seeks to ensure that when a building is substantially demolished, a demolition permit will be required, and any home rebuilt on that site will require a new construction permit. Applying for a demolition permit triggers certain obligations on the part of the applicant, including a requirement that water supply and other utilities are properly disconnected, compliance with safeguards to evade any pest control issues, or any negative environmental impacts. These same safeguards do not apply to alternate to alteration permits. In addition, alteration permits do not cover stormwater management. The committee reco recommendation was um, unanimous, and the, economy, the Economic Development Committee recommended to reclassify the bill as a non-expedited, in which case it will become effective 91 days after enactment in signing by the county executive instead of immediately upon signing by the county executive. And Bill 3022 will amend the definition of demolish so that it will mean not only the tearing down of an entire building or a structure, but also tearing down 67% of more of first story exterior walls of a once family or two family dwelling unit. Basement and cellar walls will not be considered exterior walls for purposes of measuring the 67% of wall removal. With that, uh, I deal back to the council president. Thank you very, very much, Madam Chair. I'll turn it over to the bill sponsor, Ms. Balcom. Um, thank you, and uh, in her fashion, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez did a great job in, in describing the bill. Um, and yes, it was initially uh, introduced by Councilmembers Reamer and Hucker, and it has since been co-sponsored by Councilmembers Katz, Stewart, Sales, and myself. Uh, so this is, it's, it's an important bill for two reasons. One is the demolition, and the other is the rebuild. And there have been some really egregious examples of um, uh, buildings that were t taken down all except for one tiny little wall in the basement. And a whole new house was rebuilt and without a demolition permit or without a rebuild permit. Uh, so this is just corrects that. From a safety perspective, um, as council member, as the chair pr uh, presented, uh, for demolition, there are serious safety concerns that have to happen during a demolition. And without this bill, those things have happened in the past. And, and then the rebuild, uh, someone could purchase this new home assuming it's a brand new building and not have a new building, not have a new house warranty. Uh, so this, this uh, covers that as well. Um, and so, um, and I also want to just mention that uh, in, in looking in drafting the bill in the first place and then reviewing it again, uh, I talked with the uh, Maryland Builders Association and they're interested in these protections uh, because the vast majority of the home builders follow, the, follow these rules already um, and it's really bad actors that don't. And so um, I would appreciate uh, approval of this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Balcom. Uh, the Economic Development Committee again. Oh, Ms. Coney, is there anything that we missed? Nothing missed, but I did want to just point out when we had the committee discussion, we didn't have the fiscal impact statement ready. Uh, so I just wanted to call out the fact that it's in your packet at circles 14 to 15. Okay. Taking a look at that. Um, and we have an Economic Development Committee uh, recommendation. Uh, and so, Madam Clerk, we'll... Mr. Feldman, would you like to comment? Uh, thank you, President. Uh, no, we'd just like to thank uh, Councilmember Malcolm and the uh, Economic Development Committee for storing the bill that was introduced um, by Tom Hooker and uh, former Councilmember Rima. Very good. Thank you. Madam Clerk, if you call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Luki votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. 
Council Member Jawando votes yes. Council Member Katz? Yes. Council Member Katz votes yes. Council Member Stewart? Yes. Council Member Stewart votes yes. Council Member Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Council Member Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Council Member Balcom? Yes. Council Member Balcom votes yes. Council Member Friesen? Yes. Council Member Friesen votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous for Council Member Balcom's first piece of legislation. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you, thank you all, Office of Consumer Protection. Uh, colleagues, we're now going to go to a series of work sessions, and the first work session before us is a uh, follow up conversation on compensation and OPEB. And Mr. Howard and uh, some executive department leaders will be joining us as well. Mr. Howard, or I'll turn it over yeah. to, uh, okay. sorry, Chair no, Stewart. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee met on May 5th to receive an update on the development of the long-term OPEB funding policy. Um, as next steps in this process, the committee unanimously recommends adopting two provisions as part of the FY24 operating budget resolution. The intent of the resolution provisions is to both ensure the timely review and adoption of an updated policy and ensure that resources are available in FY24 to provide any required pre-funding increase. The committee's recommendation does not impact the FY24 funding levels for OPEB as recommended by the executive and supported by the council on April 25th. Um, before I turn it over to Mr. Howard, I just want to give some short background on this is all in your packets on March 2nd the go committee met to discuss updated OPEB funding policy options for Montgomery County government at the work session the committee supported several key elements of an updated policy with an understanding that additional work was needed in reviewing investment rate of return assumptions as well as some of the internal mechanisms needed for a final policy and you can see what we included uh, in the packet also during the March 2nd work session, um, the council staff had proposed using a 6.5% investment rate. Um, the committee um, had adopted a 7.5% rate. However, um, excuse me, council staff had proposed using a 6.5% rate and uh, the county exec staff had proposed a 7.5% rate. Since then, the investment advisor for the Consolidated Retiree Health Benefit Trust Board has updated their projections on uh, the rate of return over the next 10 years, and so staff and the GO Committee is now comfortable recommending a 7.5% um, long-term rate of return. Um, and with that background, I'll turn it over uh, back to the Chair. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Howard. Thank you very much, Chair Stewart, and there's not much to add. You've, you've kind of done a great summary of, of what the committee's discussion was. Um, just there's no funding decision in front of you today and there's not a final policy that will be coming later in, in the fall so there'll be a, an opportunity for the full council to review and weigh in on, on the final policy um, I do want to thank the executive branch staff who as always have been great partners in, in working through some of the different um, components in, in working on this policy and the two uh, budget resolution provisions that council member Stewart mentioned um, the first one would be to require the executive to submit to the council no later than October 1st a draft OPEB funding policy de developed in collaboration with council staff and the county's actuarial advisors uh, that is based on the following elements closed amortization an 85 percent funded ratio target a maximum 15-year time frame to reach the funding target and a 7.5 percent investment rate of return assumption the draft policy can include options for decision points on different policy components because there may be some different um, um, things that the the first the geo committee and the full council will need to weigh in on and on how the policy um, looks and how it plays out and also the language notes that alternatives that allow the county to achieve an 85 percent target funded ratio sooner than 15 years should also be considered um, and the purpose of that is to hopefully get to the point where uh, we can start using the OPEB trust to pay for um, all the, the the current year retiree health benefit costs um, which would then over the long term free up resources to use um, for other purposes in the operating budget 
The second provision is to indicate the council's intent to utilize at least $3.5 million in FEMA reimbursement funds, assuming sufficient funds are received by the county for additional OPEB pre-funding for county government in FY24 uh, based on the final approved OPEB funding policy. Um, any additional OPEB pre-funding beyond what is appropriated by this resolution would need to be approved by the council as a supplemental or special appropriation. So this is just you know, expressing the council's intent. It's not uh, formalizing any action. Um, and it also notes that using uh, FEMA reimbursement, which is one-time uh, revenue for OPEP pre-funding is consistent with the council's fiscal policies. And so with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, the executive staff for being here and for your due diligence to all these issues and of course to the Government Operations Committee for your work. Uh, I don't see any comments or questions right now, um, so we'll continue this uh, discussion. Here we go. Uh, 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 next, uh, and you can all stay there because we got a few more items. Uh, next is work session on the FY24 uh, recommendations for the Revenue Stabilization Fund, and I'll turn it back over. Oh, okay. It's there we go, Mr. Mr. Howard. Yeah, thank you. For this one, this this uh, discussion did not go to committee, and this comes, stems okay. from the the April 11th overview discussion we had with the um, full council, um, where we mentioned there were some proposed changes to the revenue stabilization fund for FY24 by the county executive, and that we would bring it back to the full council for discussion and decision before um, taking final action on the budget. So just to kind of recap um, what the what this issue is, is um, the County's reserves consist of two primary components. The first is the revenue stabilization fund, and the second component is the general fund undesignated reserves. And as you know, the, together the policy is for the combined um, amount in these two um, components to equal 10%. The RSF is rated in county code, and it's best understood as the county's rainy day fund. Um, the law states that the county must make an annual mandatory contribution to the RSF that is the greater of A, 50% of excess revenues uh, received in any given year, and that's the provision that we'll be talking about um, this year, or B, an amount equal to the lesser of 0.5% of adjusted gross revenues and the amount needed to obtain a total reserve of 10%. The, the RSF is more restrictive, as I mentioned, than, than the uh, undesignated general fund reserves. The council can only use uh, the county can only use RSF funds by an affirmative vote of several of seven council members after a public hearing, and the council is expected to receive an update on relevant economic indicators and seek the executive's recommendation before approving the use of any RSF funds. And under the RSF, uh, the use of it is restricted to appropriations that have become unfunded during the fiscal year. On the other hand, the undesignated general fund reserves is a balance of money that's, that sits in the reserves and can be used for supplemental or special appropriations as, as needed throughout the year. As part of the executive's recommended budget, they do uh, estimate ending FY23 uh, at 14% reserves, as we've talked about before, with 10% in the RSF and 3.9% in the unrestricted general fund reserves. And to achieve the allocation that they recommended, uh, the, the executive does recommend the council approve a one-time deferral of the FY23 mandatory contribution to the RSF due to excess revenues. And we provided some explanation the executive branch um, had shared when they submitted the budget, and that was discussed in, in, back in April. And the table on page two of the staff report shows um, what the difference is between uh, doing the one-time referral deferral and not doing the one-time deferral would mean. The totals in the reserves are the same um, in, each, in each scenario. The only difference is whether how much is put in the RSF versus in the undesignated general fund reserves. Um, in addition, the county executive has requested that the Department of Finance, Office of Management and Budget, and the Office of the County Attorney work with the council during FY24 to review and determine if any updates to the revenue stabilization fund law should be considered. If the uh, council chooses to implement this provision, it would need to include uh, language in the budget resolution to do so, and at the bottom of page two, we provide a draft language from the Office of the County Attorney to do this. Um, the staff recommendation is twofold. One, to support the executive's proposed one-time deferral of the mandatory contribution to the RSF and FY23 due to excess revenues. Um, we feel that approving the one-time deferral will provide the county with more flexibility in FY24 without negatively impacting the county's fiscal position. And the second recommendation is that we support a more detailed review of the RSF law during FY24 to determine whether any changes or updates are warranted. As the council has previously done with other fiscal policy elements, it, it does make sense to periodically review and assess um, 
different policies to determine what factors have changed since uh, they were initially implemented and see if any changes are warranted. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Vice President Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to uh, executive staff and, and council staff. I, I'm going to support this, uh, but I support it with extreme caution. And the extreme caution is that there's two funds here. One fund has lots of restrictions and the other fund really doesn't. And we are presented with a budget that we're going to be making some tough decisions on in the coming days that at this point, by all accounts, is going to have a significant structural deficit. The size of that structural deficit still is yet to be determined, but it came to this body with a $145 million hole in it with no plan, no proposal, no thought of how we're going to address that issue. And so my concern here, and I just want to note it, and I just think we need to think about it, uh, is that we are putting in funding for flexibility that I believe we're likely going to need to address the issue that this budget has put before us. However, if we use that flexibility in a way that exacerbates the problem as opposed to addressing the problem, we are going to be in for a rude awakening. And I just think that it needs to be noted as we make this decision that the flexibility that this is providing must be used in a way that addresses the issues that we have now inherited with a recommended budget that has significant ongoing fiscal challenges that creates problems rather than solves them. And this recommendation will provide some flexibility in order to address that, but only if we are prudent and only if we are thoughtful uh, as we do it. So I'll support it, but I support it with some concern and reservation and uh, ongoing uh, caution as we move forward. With that, I'll yield back. Uh, appreciate those comments. Uh, you know, as we come into the final week or so of this budget, there are going to be some real tough conversations. There are tough deliberations that are happening uh, right now um, as we have worked through this budgetary process and all the straw votes uh, up until date have been unanimous and we are working to reconcile what we have. Uh, and all of that will become clearer in the coming days, um, but uh, there is certainly work that we need to address moving forward beyond this budget. Um, and uh, appreciate the council vice president for echoing those sentiments. Council member Jawanda. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to ask, this has come up, not this direct issue, but related issues about what the right reserve policy is and how we treat it over time. and. Uh, could the executive branch speak to the process by which, if there is one, you're going to review what changes might need to be made between these two funds? I do think it's something I'll support that today. I think it makes sense for the flexibility we need this year. But this larger question of there's community confusion around this. Uh, there's uh, just the, you know, I think there's council member confusion on this. With, you know, there's different opinion so what's the process and how how are you looking at this going forward or very good question mr Jawando. thank you um we will be working with our fa's along with council staff financial oh, advisors yes i'm sorry financial advisors <laughs> sorry yes we will be working with our financial advisors uh to make sure that the revenue stabilization fund and the uh and the undesignated reserve are handled properly in the law, that we have a good policy in place. Um, I have, uh, here's my markup of the RSF. It has about a dozen changes or uh, questions that I've put together since the uh, policy was passed in uh, March of 2021, I believe. And uh, those are things that we'll be talking with the financial advisors about, with OMB, with council staff, uh, and with you all. Um, so we will be vetting uh, any any recommendations, any thoughts that we might have, we will be asking the financial advisors uh, what what would be the uh, best policies to have. Uh, the Government Finance Officers Association uh, is the is the uh, international organization that uh, that many of us belong to. They have um, they have their own best practices as well. So we'll be taking those into consideration uh, along with 
Montgomery County's very specific circumstances and, uh, and information that we know uh, about how the rating agencies uh, view us and other triple, triple A jurisdictions. And prior to next year's budget submission. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And I just, I think, obviously, I know GO will care, but I think that this is such a big issue. The entire council, you know, I would love to request that we, you come back at some point with us, maybe when we do a budget update, Ms. Michelson, or something, that we can engage with you as you're making those, seeing that markup, once you're ready to share, you know, yep. and you have those conversations. It's just such an important point. We probably all going to come from different places, more aggressive, less aggressive, but we, we all want the information and to be able to be you know using the same information to give feedback so i appreciate that i agree and i i don't think anything is off the table including the size of the reserve so yeah. we'll talk yeah. about that as well, well thank you thank mm -hmm. you we should be having budget conversations uh throughout the year and i look forward to the geo committee uh, further continuing this conversation councilmember ludke thank you mr president um I agree with the sentiments expressed by uh, Council Vice President Friedson and, of course, appreciate that regular housekeeping, whether it's policies and procedures, regulations or statutes, are always um, welcome. And we should have an eye to that on a regular basis, um, particularly when it comes to the financial health of our county. Um, but I, I do have concerns and, and want you know, to instill a sense of um, reservation and careful treading moving forward uh, in this arena, uh, you know, that that uh, something may look good in the short term, but isn't really good for us or wise in the long term. And um, we need to be endlessly cognizant, not just of the here and now, but of the foreseeable future. Um, and uh, and I, with that, I yield back to you, Council President. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Albernage. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and appreciate the co uh, comments from colleagues. Mr. Covey, you last year was my first time going through the bond rating process as Council President. Council President Glass will be going through that shortly. Um, there was some concern uh, that there had been some policy changes by uh, one or two of the bond rating agencies last year. And fortunately, as was always been the case, the county still is in very good standing. Um, I concur with the recommendations that have been made, but could you just expand a little bit about uh, the connection between the decision we're making today and the bond rating agencies and how it relates? Yes, absolutely. Good question. Um, we are, uh, reserves are one of the main indicators that the rating agencies use to, uh, to determine our creditworthiness along with everybody else's. Um, uh, Montgomery County uh, has, a, a uh, policy in place, a law in place for the RSF uh, and, and, uh, and for the undesignated reserves that uh, substantially treats our revenue base differently than most of the rating agencies. So one of the things that we will look at, and this is partially uh, answering your question, is you know, how, how we categorize our revenues, what is available for the county council uh, to budget every year, as opposed to how do the rating agencies categorize our uh, revenues, uh, because they're materially different. Uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a negative thing for them to be different. We just need to be cognizant of where the differences are uh, and make sure that we meet uh, uh, requirements that uh, are our legal obligations as the as the county, but also meet uh, the requirements that the rating agencies are setting uh, using slightly different calculations than we have. Um, so this this particular area is just one of many areas that the rating agencies look at uh, us on. Uh, it happens to be an area that um, that trip up trips up a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, around the country. Um, and so w it would be an area we would work, make sure it was bolstered and was where it needed to be once we are finished with pulling together the policy for review next uh, October, November, whenever, whenever we're finished with it. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just want to thank council staff, um, the Department of Finance, and OMB for your hard work on this um, and want to express my support for the executive's one-time deferral 
for the mandatory contribution to the rent stabilization fund. Um, just had a question about this occurrence. Um, when did income tax revenues last exceed the approved projections before FY 22 and 23? We'd, we'd have to look that up. I'm sorry. I, no. I think 20, I think 21 did as well. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we'll have to take a look and we'll let you know. Okay. That, that would be helpful. And is it reasonable to expect? that we may face the same situation next year? Um, and if so, is there anything we can do to maximize or use for these funds? Do you, uh, but, um, let me, may I ask you more about the question that you have? Yes. Are you asking, is it likely that we're gonna have higher income tax revenues than what we expect right now? Yes. Okay, it is, it is, not unlikely that we would. Uh, we we do, we, we, the way we do the projections, there is, there's there's more upside risk than downside risk in a, in a good way. It's more, it's slightly more likely that we would get more money than less money the way we do the projections, and that's one of the reasons that we've. Uh, under forecast for the last mm -hmm. uh, couple of years at least. Okay, and I believe we get quarterly reports from the executive mm -hmm. about? Yeah. There is a, a an interagency, it's a council and, uh, and executive branch uh, group called the uh, Revenue Estimators Group. Okay. Uh, many of the people sitting in this table right now are on that mm -hmm. group and some of the people up on your dais are in that group as okay. well and we do report quarterly the last uh, one that you received was yesterday last night actually okay all right so we get those from you quarterly okay thank you that's all You're I welcome. Have. okay um so colleagues all those in favor of these recommendations for the revenue stabilization fund that is unanimous and also just want to go back we can take a, a formal hand vote on the comp uh, compensation follow-up regarding OPEB so all those in favor of that recommendation from GEO very good thank you thank you all we'll continue that conversation so the next item is a resolution to appoint a new clerk of the court which means that a uh, clerk, uh, clerk you, I'm getting ahead of myself. Cler the clerk of the council is leaving to become clerk of the entire Maryland judiciary as administrator. Um, so, Judy Rupp, you have been um, a ray of sunshine and of efficiency um, since you joined us a little less than two years ago. Um, and you have uh, helped uh, update and modernize the office of the clerk and you have seen us through this um, important transition from a nine member body to an 11 member body with a majority new and a majority female uh, and uh, you've, you've really helped us get to this really good spot um, and I know you came from the judiciary uh, and you're you've now spent um, the last year and a half or so in, in the council and the legislative branch and you're going on to to go back to the state as administrator for the Maryland judiciary um, so you certainly know your separation of powers uh, I'm not going to ask you which branch you prefer but uh, uh, I, I, I hope you um, have you know um, I, I hope that this experience while helping transition us uh, to this point um, has provided you with um, personal gratification, um, helping our community as well, um, seeing the other facets of government and how the laws that we are creating uh, are administered uh, on your side and uh, provide you with uh, that unique perspective. You wanna share any thoughts with us? First, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to be your clerk it truly has been such a pleasure. I've been inspired by seeing all of what you do to support our communities and the care and concern you display every day for every citizen of Montgomery County. 
um, it's just been an extraordinary opportunity to see your dedication and I thank you for that. I want to thank Marlene and Craig and Selena and the amazing Clark team for all of their help and support. Um, your future is in great hands with Sarah. Uh, she is just amazing and I know she'll um, serve you well. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you and the, and the yeah, applause. <laughs> The Clark team is fantastic, and uh, they will continue to be fantastic. Uh, Councilmember Jawanda. Just, just want to briefly say uh, thank you. Uh, I, I have really good seatmates, and you've been and you've been one of them. And uh, I know all of us feel just grateful for your care, concern, professionalism, uh, work ethic, which I've seen at the rehab. We shared rehab when I was rehabbing my Achilles in the morning. We would come out sweating together. Um, and just wish you the best as you move back to the judiciary, but thank you. And excited about Sarah too. Councilmember Albernos. Um, thanks, couldn't miss this opportunity. I had the opportunity to work my entire year as council president with Judy, and it's a weird job as council president class has learned, um, and, but the clerk is so important to making the work seamless. And uh, there's so much that happens behind the scenes. It's only when things are screwed up that people notice, and they never are. Uh, it's really extraordinary. So, um, but we are going to be in great hands, and we do wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, and especially thank you, Judy. Um, so there is a resolution to appoint Sarah Tenenbaum as the next clerk of the council. Can I have a motion? Motion. Uh, moved by Council <laughs> Member, uh, moved by Council Member Albanaz, seconded by Vice President Friedson. All those in favor of appointing Sarah Tenenbaum as our next clerk of the council. And that is unanimous. No turning back now, Sarah. <laughs> okay, uh, on to the consent calendar. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Motion to approve. So moved. Uh, moved by Council Member Ludke, seconded by Council Member Sales. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. And with that, we are in recess. <laughs>